Hi everyone, my name is Yuhalu. I am one of the social science tags. Hi everyone, my name is Steven Herrera Tenorio. I'm uh, one of the other social science tags. Welcome to the 2021 Social Science Cornerstone presentation at Governor's School East. The students have been preparing for four and a half weeks for this research presentation. I was super excited to present to everyone, so I hope you all enjoy it. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is James Watson. I'm Cooper Hildall. Uh, today we're going to be talking to you about partisan gerrymandering. So our group's question is how can the United States eliminate partisan gerrymandering in congressional elections? Uh, so, so the methods we use, uh, we first researched what gerrymandering is and how it's been used historically in the U.S. Uh, then we looked at some judicial involvement and how the courts have intervened in the past. And then lastly, we use that information to look at new ways of how to stop gerrymandering and how to make the system more fair to everyone. So let's first talk about what gerrymandering is. So Cornell Law Institute defines uh, partisan gerrymandering as when political or electoral districts are drawn for the purpose of giving one political party or group an advantage over another. Uh, we've gone a step further and simply define it as rigging the game, um, essentially what gerrymandering is. Uh, so how, how redistricting works, gerrymandering is the process that works redistricting. Redistricting is when states draw their congressional district map uh, based on uh, decennial census data every 10 years. Uh, and the districts are to be drawn based on a proportion of population with equal population in each. That's the one person, one uh, vote rule for Reynolds v. Sin in 1964. This is the current uh, North Carolina district map, if you're curious. Um, this is the official North Carolina state legislature language on uh, uh, redistricting. Um, they say that pretty basically that they redraw the maps based on population, but it's interesting in this sentence down here, they say that due to legal challenges, there's often mid-decade redistricting activity as well. Um, in this sentence, they basically admit that they often gerrymander, and because of that, they have to change the map. So they're pretty open about it here. Um, and NC, more specifically, the North Carolina State Legislature draws the maps. They submit those maps to approval in both chambers of the legislature. Uh, but unlike most states, the North Carolina governor cannot veto the legislature's proposed map. Um, and there is no law requiring public input on redistricting. But there have been opportunities in a couple of past years to do so. Uh, more of NC's storied history with gerrymandering. Uh, in 2016, the proposed map had a 10 Republican, 3 Democrat split, which is obviously wildly disproportionate because NC's partisan makeup is far split more evenly. Um, and then uh, the guy in charge of this process, whose name was David Lewis, yes, David Lewis um, said very plainly that his goal was to use political data to give his party a partisan advantage. Very blatant about it. Um, so this is a little bit of gerrymandering in action in regards to maps. You can see that uh, when Republicans draw it, they have more seats in Congress. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how the courts play a role in overseeing uh, this process. All right. The traditional law that when it comes to gerrymandering. So in theory, uh, gerrymandering violates two amendments, the 14th and the 15th. The 14th protects your as an equal protection of law and as your and it protects your life, liberty, and property. The 15th protects your right to vote. Uh, first, and a president who chose the shop for Serena. Uh, North Carolina wanted to guarantee black only districts, so they create, so they, they want African American representation in, the, in Congress. And to vote. And five North Carolina residents appealed this, say that wasn't constitutional. So, on a 5 4 vote, they decided that this violated the 14th Amendment because it separated people by race. And that next set of presidents is Shelby County's Beholder, which uh, before, prior to Shelby County Beholder, you had to have free clearance before, before changing your voting laws. And so Shelby County felt that there were step Congress was bound and that it was unconstitutional. So that five four vote, they concurred with Shelby County that the this part, this clause of the Voting Rights Act was unconstitutional. This really opened in the gerrymandering floodgates because they did not have to have free clearance. Justice Department. And so this kind of essentially gutted the, uh, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Our 
final piece of precedent is uh, Richard vs. Tommy Paul, which is a fairly recent case. In 2019, uh, residents of North Carolina, some of the representatives of North Carolina felt that that this would that federal courts were representing their vows when it came to partisan gerrymandering cases. And so in a five-four decision, they said that the court had no jurisdiction when it came to the side of partisan matters. So when it comes to addressing issues, the court doesn't really have a test when it comes to determining what a jury, whether there is partisan gerrymandering. Gerrymandering has been a perplexing topic that's stumped the judicial system for years. So we have some solutions that aren't don't include the judicial system, but more uh, Congress. All right, we've heard all the problems, time for some solutions. So one solution being proposed is multi-member districts. So this is blue on Georgia here. It has 14 districts. Each district elects one person. In the purple um, map, there's only four districts, but each district elects three different people. So in the blue map, if there was a, say, 51 to 49 percent split, the 51 percent uh, winner would get all the seats um, and there only one rep from the whole 49 percent would have no say in government. However, in the purple map, you get a 51 49 split. The 51 percent party would get two seats and the 49 percent would get one seat. So it's a bit more fair and it um, allows for protection of the minority. Um, and so Illinois had this system in place before 1892, and it allowed for a lot of diversity and ideology in the members of the Illinois House. So if you see on this side, um, there's a lot of variance in ideology because people could find a little niche spot in their district and only win that number of votes, but still get a seat. Um, however, when we got rid of that practice, the ideologies became much more similar to the rest of the party because they had to match the party platform to win a seat. So take that as you will, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, that's up for you to decide. Um, another solution is commissions. Lots of states, all the states in yellow, use commissions to, or not all the states, but a lot of states in yellow use commissions to decide their maps. Um, but not all commissions are created the same. So in Arizona, the commissions are very fair. The courts um, pick 25 nominees, and then the state, house, and senate minority and majority leaders get to pick one person. And they all get together and pick a fifth person. So there is no partisan lean of the uh, commission. That's a very fair process. However, in Utah, the government gets a pick, and there is no um, nonpartisan member of the, of the commission. So um, the commission tends to have a partisan lean. This can be seen in the two maps. So in Arizona, the maps are very evenly split. However, in Utah, Republicans won all the districts. So that brings us to our final solution, simply having fair maps. So we made this map here um, in North Carolina. Uh, and some cool things about it, it has four competitive seats. Uh, this blue one here, uh, the teal, and the light blue one here, uh, the yellow one, and the pink one. So they're all within 10 points and can be won by either party in a wave here. Uh, and so there's three majority minority districts. That means at least half the population is a minority group. And North Carolina is typically African Americans. Um, and so those districts are the brown one, the yellow one, and the lime green one. Uh, lastly, it has two 40% or more minority districts. And so those districts give a significant chance for a minority to get elected. Uh, but based on population constraints, we couldn't give a majority. So um, as for election results, the, in the governor race in 2020, Roy Cooper won the state by about 4.5 points. So we wanted to give him eight districts to Dan Forrest's six. So here, he flipped the suburban district around Charlotte, uh, and then narrowly won it, which gave him a majority of congressional seats. Um, however, Trump won that seat, as well as the seat uh, west of the Triangle. And so Trump won eight districts, and Biden won six, which makes sense because Trump won the um, state by about one point. So he should win more districts, theoretically. However, in the map that the um, NC legislative group, um, Trump won many more districts than he won proportionally to the um, popular vote. And so if us three can agree on a fair map and trust us, trust, uh, I mean, we all have very different opinions on things. If we all can agree on fair maps, then why can't the North Carolina State Legislature do that? Thank you. Thanks, guys.
Hello, my name is Luis Tejada. I'm Lee Mashigeti. I'm Sophia Faruqi. And we're going to talk about child care. So, our question is how would a system of universal child care affect American society? So, first, let's talk about child care. Well, child care has three basic goals uh, to develop a child, uh, children and help them with their learning, uh, to help parents be able to participate in the workforce and contribute to the economy, and to prepare children for the future. But there are a lot of problems in our flawed system. So for the first, uh, first thing, it, it's expensive. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services said that it should cost no more than 7% of a family's income. But many working class families pay from 9 to 22% of their income, which is, is a lot. Uh, there's low access to good quality child care. And workers are not fairly compensated for their hard work in the child care system. Regardless, workers are not fairly compensated for their hard work. Regardless of income, 50, over 50% of families find it Somewhat difficult or very difficult to find good, good child care. Even with uh, incomes over $75,000, many find it very difficult to find good, affordable child care. So here's a short video. Alicia and Craig needed an early year education program for their two year old son, Jaden. Eventually, they found a suitable child care center nearby that offers a nurturing environment for Jaden and is open while they're at work. But it costs nearly $10,000 per year. That's more than a mortgage in most states. Even though they're paying the average price for child care, it's a financial burden, and now they're expecting a second child. Meanwhile, Jaden's teacher, Sonia, is worrying about how to put food on her own table. Even though she has a bachelor's degree, she earns less than $15 an hour. In fact, more than half of child care workers and nearly half of preschool and kindergarten teachers reside in families that utilize public assistance. So, who does this affect? Well, today, more than 5 million children under the age of 6 in the United States live in poverty. This extra financial burden on families is unnecessary and very challenging. The, this graph shows a couple of ways that families have to cope with this financial burden, including having family members take care of the children instead, or quitting jobs and cutting hours as well. So what if this financial burden wasn't on these families? What would be different? Okay, so our methods. So we looked at different um, journal articles pertaining to child care, and we found articles that specifically address um, the cost of child care, the role child care has on um, child development, and how child care on young children can have on their potential employment. So child care development. Recognizing the impact of child care on child's development is beneficial to future human capital. Future are the children of the future, and they will take over all of our jobs, careers, and essentially the world. So childcare has been seen to positively impact girls, which also helps to combat the gender wage gap. Um, early, early childhood and preschool programs are beneficial to a child's development. Um, learning is a lot easier at younger ages than it is later in life. So, for example, the first three years of a child's life, it is critical for language acquisition, which is just learning to speak and use words. Um, early child interactions for both families and the school system have a considerable, considerable effect on the child's life and development. Although child care is important to help with peer interactions and things like that, it is also the parents and family's job to help accommodate and enforce the things that they learn in a good environment of childcare. 
And lastly, early childhood educational programs can lead to uh, short learning advances, such as math and reading skills increase. Um, depending on the area, the increase does vary, but we have found in our research that um, it's always an increase, typically. And it can improve a child's long-term um, potential in particularly low-income families and employment. Um, so, what's the relationship between childcare and women's employment? Um, a lot of women, especially with young children, end up leaving the work uh, environment and leaving the leaving their jobs or pursuing more flexible work hours so they can spend more time with their children. And oftentimes, this ends up with uh, trading off wages for more flexible work hours. Um, also, this is uh, contributed to the lack of childcare is contributed to. Um, a rise in women being self-employed because obviously they have a lot more flexibility over their hours rather than dealing with managers or bosses. Um, while this does allow for women to spend more time with their children, um, there's been research that shows that when children spend time with uh, professionals who are trained to work with children and trained to help uh, boost their um, education and social skills, like in an environment like preschool, um, it translates better uh, for their skills in the future rather than um, spending time just with family. Um, also, uh, there's a financial burden as Louise talked about, um, and this oftentimes uh, affects low-income families, single-family households as well. So thinking about um, whether we had a system of child care that subsidized the system of child care, um, it would allow for um, low-income families to get the same access too expensive and hard to uh, get child care as um, higher income families. Um, putting uh, their children in child care would allow these women and families to um, probably um, be able to uh, provide for their families at uh, better anyway. So it, it seems like a win. Um, so child care has long term effects not only on child development, but on society as a whole. Uh, there's been research that shows that um, children in child care from a young age can make um, higher wages when they grow up and contribute more back into society. Uh, this has even been shown in research that uh, suggests that a subsidized uh, system of child care will end up paying for itself. While it does seem like a lot of spending money um, there are uh, aspects in the U.S. budget that could allow for paying um, now for a system of child care that would end up working out better in the future because these kids would grow up to make more wages and be more productive. Um, however, there does need to be some stratification. There's some research that shows that um, children of low-income uh, parents would benefit substantially from child care expansion, um, whereas parents who can already pay for it um, don't see a huge difference in how their um, children develop. So, uh, looking forward, uh, there needs to be specific stratifications for how a government subsidized child care system would work. Um, and just having a blanket child care system is not the solution. Everyone, my name is Jenny Nisindra. My name is Lisa Korpati. And I'm oh sorry, I'm also part of Kevin Lynch. <laughs> and um, we're here to talk to you guys about the implementation of them and the American public's consent for them. In our research question is basically how does media sensationalism contribute to the American public's consent for them? So we have split our presentation up into three parts. So first we're going to go over key concepts that are essential to understand for the media representation. And then we're going to see how these concepts can be applied in both history and current day. So first, first let's go over key concepts. So consent for war is fairly self-explanatory, but it's basically the warrant or approval for conflict. 
And then media sensationalism is the use and presentation of content um, designed to cause interest or excitement. So this can include vivid illustrations, multi-column headlines, and uh, big bold letters. Um, and the next term is racialization, which is used to refer to social relations in which racial meanings are attached. So this basically means that um, it's the act of applying a racial character to something or someone, and this can be both conscious or subconscious. And finally, propaganda, which most of you know about, but these are ideas, facts, or allegations spread deliberately to further one's cause or to damage an opposing cause. So basically, this can be manipulating words so by either highlighting certain facts or omitting others in order to further your point. Okay, so next we'll be looking at the American private media model. In their book, Manufacturing Consent, Herman and Chomsky delineate five key filters that determine the media's political bias and slant. The first is the ownership of the media. The second is the funding sources. The third is the information sourcing. The fourth is flag, which is just essentially negative response. And the fifth is anti-communism or fear ideology as a means to preserve order and structure. And you're probably wondering, what is Marvel Avengers doing up there? Well, the, well, Marvel has a lot of parallels to the American government. And so naturally, it gets a lot of its information from the Department of Defense. And the Department of Defense, while not funding Marvel, it supplies them with information and access to the information. And of course, this would work to further, um, further American interests through their entertainment. And while not funding, it does meet the third filter of information sourcing. But nothing to feel guilty about, I'll still be watching Marvel movies. And then from this quote, basically in sum, it's saying that the American media model is unique. And this is because it often takes an adversarial stance, criticizing the government and the government's actions. But even in this criticism, it's often limited to whatever the elite or the people who have control over the media and influence the media's consensus is. So now we're going to look at these concepts in a historical context. So a prime example is the Spanish-American War. So we're going to look at two aspects of the war, yellow journalism and the Delon letter. So yellow journalism stemmed from the competition between Joseph Holzer and his New York World publication and William Rydell versus his New York Journal publication. So you know, yellow journalism entails that sensational style of um, newspapers and uh, the epitome of yellow journalism was in 1898 when Ulysses' name sunk in Havana Harbor. So both Hearst and Poulter are very anti-Spanish, so it made it seem as if the Spanish had plotted this explosion. And so this outraged the American public and provided the government with the so-called consent for war. And the second example is the Delon letter, which was written by the Spanish ambassador Delon, and it criticized President William McKinley, and he basically characterized him as a weak president. And so um, Cuban revolutionaries intercepted the letter and then gave it to Hearst, who then published it in his newspaper in February of 1898 with the headline, The Worst Insult the United States Has Had in History. And so while the letter was critical of the president, it was nowhere near as bad as this headline suggested. And so this made the people super angry because some Spanish guy was basically criticizing the president. And so just two months later in April, the US government finally and so these are examples of yellow journalism. You can see the vivid illustrations, the big bold typography, and then on your right is the Delong letter. Okay, so next the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War is a prime case of black or negative response impacting and influencing media bias and slam. Initially, when the war had begun, there was little to no broadcasted dissent, and there were high approval ratings. And in 1965, there was near total editorial support for US intervention. And when the anti-war movement was covered in the media, it was always discussing their tactics, but not necessarily their views, which virtually and effectively excluded opposition and dissent in the media. However, as the war progressed, there was an increasing amount of anti-war sentiment among the elite who have control and influence over the media, and they began to view the Vietnam War as a tragic mistake that was proving to be too costly to continue. And so this broadened the domain in which the media could criticize and debate the U.S.'s intervention in the Vietnam War. And if you look at the graph here, when the Tet Offensive happened, the red line, which is disapproval rating, started to increase drastically while the approval rating started to decrease. And here's some pictures of the media during the Vietnam War during that era. So right here to your upper left, we have two pictures 
that are basically uh, editorial support of the Vietnam War. And to the bottom left and the upper right, here's some famous anti-war pictures that were basically, that led to the um, huge drops of approval for the Vietnam War. And then once at the bottom right, it is a picture of the documentary in the year of the pig. And the year of the pig was a very uh, controversial documentary because it released in 1969 uh, in the middle of the Vietnam War. And basically the main message of this war was to was to um, basically say it was anti-war. And the main message was trying to describe and explain the capitalist machines and political machines behind the war and how many of the, it was, there was a military industrial conflict basically going on because many of the war's motives were uh, driven by industrial motives. And right now we'll go through current day examples. So basically the first current day example we have is the Afghanistan and Iraq war, which has been going on for basically all of our lifetimes. So first I'll be talking about the media war being used by the American government. So right here, uh, right after the 9-11 uh, incident attack um, with the Bush administration basically uh, just went straight to work and established multiple organizations and institutions. So right, uh, these bottom three right here, the Office of Strategic Influence, also known as the OSI, was established nearly two, minute, uh, two months afterwards. And then the US British Disinformation Campaign and the establishment of the World Communication Organization as well. So these three organizations basically, uh, and, and along with the White House, had the main goal of correlating, connecting the Middle East, Iraq, Saddam Hussein, all with 9-11. So it gave this false uh, sense of objective to the US public of why the US was actually in the Middle East, which was the war on terror, while the real objective of the US was to secure the oil supply in Iraq. And also another thing was that uh, the U.S. also kind of falsely accused and used propaganda to make it seem like Saddam Hussein in Iraq at that time did have weapons of mass destruction when in fact it didn't. Yeah, so through the use of the word genocide in mainstream media, you can actually see what the uh, U.S. government and media looked favorably upon or not. And specifically looking at number four, where it talks about Iraq and its control of the Kurdish population, you can see that overwhelmingly the word genocide was used to describe the situation in Iraq. And this is further evidence of the US trying to implicate um, Iraq in order to go into Iraq for the war on terror. Yeah, and another recent example is the racialization of Asian Americans during the pandemic. Um, if you look to the left, there's a CDC journal published on May 2020, in May 2020, which is very recent, has very clear racist undertones. And then in the middle, this is a sensational title with very much anti-Chinese rhetoric in White Box News. And yeah, essentially during the pandemic, there was a lot of sensational titles that racialized Asian Americans through stereotyping and reducing them to essentially just a monolith that was associated with China and COVID. And this has not only worked to increase anti-Chinese sentiment, but also materialize that sentiment into aggression and hate crimes against the Asian American community. So it's really important that when during a time of fear and panic to look to to be mindful of the words and sensational titles that we're reading so as to not escalate anti-Chinese and hateful sentiment. And then if you look to this key threat research center study right here, 40% of Asian Americans said they felt uncomfortable with how people treated them during um, the pandemic. So you're probably wondering what should we believe? Because the more competition there is in the news markets, the more sensationalized stories that are produced. And we've clearly seen the negative effects of media sensationalism. Uh, the population doesn't really understand what exactly they're getting into because they're only exposed to certain information. And so the resolution is to keep a critical eye out for the filters of media. Um, it's up to us to basically filter through the media that we consume, um, rather than relying on one particular news source, try to research um, information from many different news sources. Um, because news is not objective and essential to find credible data to confirm statements that the media have. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Our presentation is a history and analysis of incarceration in the United States. 
Our research question is how do the origins of the prison industrial complex continue to affect minority identities and experiences? We will mainly be focusing on the incarceration of African Americans. For our methods, we researched the rates of recidivism, or essentially people who were incarcerated, were released, and then were reconvicted of crime. Of crime. Additionally, we researched the demographics of incarcerated individuals, economic benefits and downsides, the history of personal labor, and welfare in the past. So, to understand the context of our presentation, we first need to understand the 13th Amendment. Uh, as you can see here, the 13th Amendment reads as such neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. However, those of us familiar with ellipses are aware that there is a missing phrase there. Except as punishment for reported crime or a party shall have been fully convicted. This effectively means that in the United States, if you have been convicted of a crime, you are subject to slavery. The 13th Amendment plays a big role in the origin of the prison industrial complex. But before we get into it, let's define it. The Encyclopedia of Diversity and Social Justice describes the prison industrial complex as a practice of incarcerating people for the purpose of punishment. However, others would describe it as the increase of prisons due to profit rather than the need for rehabilitation. Uh, with the profit incentive in mind, let's look at the post-Civil War South. After the Civil War, the South was crippled both agriculturally and industrially. Uh, Sherman's march to the sea destroyed a lot of the agricultural uh, elements. You know, plantations were burned, fields were salted and burned, and uh, a lot of factories as well were destroyed. So the South really had no uh, ways of, you know, accumulating wealth. And additionally, because of the end of slavery, uh, there was no large labor source, which was very important for making money. As you can see, culture without former slaves, the South was agriculturally and economically crippled. This leads into the solution of sorts, the origins of convict leasing. From an, economic, from an economic standpoint, convict leasing replaced this lost form of labor, and societally it perpetuated the second class status of people of color, continuing to dehumanize and disenfranchise. Later in this presentation, we'll talk more on the disenfranchisement caused by incarceration. Additionally, it caused no ability for black people to accumulate power, economic growth, or anything like that. As we can see in these two images, the similarities are painstakingly obvious. Convict leasing essentially became a new version of slavery. This quote reads, by 1900, the South's judicial system had been wholly reconfigured to make one of its primary purposes the coercion of African Americans to comply with the labor demands of whites. And at this time, 70% of some state's annual revenue came from convict leasing. Now let's talk about one of the main contributing factors of the prison industrial complex, which is mass incarceration. The Gale Encyclopedia would describe mass incarceration as the increase of people within prison beginning in the 1970s. In this graph, we can see the it represents what the Gale Encyclopedia was talking about as the increase of mass incarceration after 1970s. This quote describes how mass incarceration is involved within the prison industrial complex, basically saying if mass incarceration benefits the, the prison industrial complex, then it will continue regardless of reforms. In this graph, we can see how the rate of incarceration based on race is vastly disproportionate, seeing how it continues in its history of racism. Now let's talk about some of the misconceptions about mass incarceration. According to the Prison Policy Initiative, only 9% of people are actually held in private prison. This means even though private prisons contribute to the prison industrial complex, they are not the root of the problem and therefore should not be the focus of reforms. Furthermore, the community supervision, like parole and probation, are not the answer to overcrowding of prisons, because two out of every three released prisoners will return to prison after three years. Though it is thought that prisons stay running because of the selling of cheap labor, it's actually the prisoners who keep it running. 
They are responsible for cleaning, cooking, and even fixing the prisons every day and are paid criminally low wages if they're paid at all for their work. Uh, with the exploitative nature of the low pay that prisoners receive for you know, upkeeping prisons, let's talk about capitalism and slavery. The boom in carceral punishment obviously leads to a boom in prison labor, and the exploitative nature of that hasn't changed at all, as seen by this graph here. Even the highest wages that these prisoners are making, 515, does not come close to minimum wage in this country. The minimum wage they are owed as laborers in the United States. Uh, and on the lower end, they'll be paid literally zero dollars. Objectively slavery. Uh, continuing on with their exploitation, prisoners are incapable of unionizing, which means that even if they wanted to, which I assume most of them would, they are incapable of arguing for the minimum wage they are owed. Additionally, prison labor takes away jobs from non-incarcerated individuals, especially in the manufacturing sector. People manufacturing things like uh, engines, for example, are losing their jobs to people who are being paid significantly less than them. And from a business standpoint, this makes sense. We want to look for the cheapest possible labor. Additionally, uh, prison labor doesn't really provide that much of a decrease in recidivism. Uh, in a study done by Florida State University uh, in collaboration with the Department of Justice, it was found that only about actually less than a percent of difference between people who participated in work release programs and those who didn't return to jail, the difference was very minor. And as we can see from this graph, it exacerbates poverty because this displays the lost wages from uh, people being incarcerated. Now I'm going to show you two photographs. This photograph was taken in 1903, about 40 years after the end of slavery. And the second photograph was taken in 2017, four years ago. Looking at these pictures in tandem, what has meaningfully changed? What has the United States done to actually fulfill the promise of abolition in the country? The answer is nothing. Let's move into the social effects of the prison industrial complex. Let's take a minute. Let's look at this graph. There is no state in the United States that does not have restrictions for incarcerated people. The North Carolina alone has 965 restrictions. The lowest is Vermont with 319. And the highest, clearly, Louisiana with 2,218. Roughly 50% of these restrictions after incarceration are for employment. How are people supposed to escape this system? if they can't get jobs. Let's talk about stereotypes. In urban areas, there are approximately 26 to 37% more black women than black men. In 2008, former President Obama gave a speech on Father's Day. During this speech, he spoke to black men, encouraging them to be more present. CNN and the New York Times lauded this speech, but none of them acknowledged the role of incarceration. How are black men supposed to be present if they are in prison? This leads to the stereotype that black men are just absent colors. The mass incarceration of people of color is a big part of the reason a black child born today is less likely to be raised by both parents than a black child born during slavery. In reality, Research by Boston College social psychologist Rebecca Lemon Coley found that black fathers not living at home are more likely to keep in contact with their children than fathers of any other racial or ethnic or racial group. This is just a stereotype, and it's reinforced by the media and by mass incarceration. Our second stereotype is that black people are just lazy. They don't want to find jobs. They don't want education. This is absolutely false. Federal aid forms require you to check that box if you've been convicted of a crime. Additionally, there's just a lack of opportunity. The largest indicator of pursuing higher education is poverty and the education your parents receive, something that Black people in America do not have. In reality, after prison, there are incredibly limited opportunities. The United States Federal Reserve said Black owned businesses are two times likelier to be rejected for loans. Our results are effectively that the prison industrial complex has had an adversely negative effect on the black community specifically, and the solutions are complicated. Some people call for reforms to prison and policing, while others call for direct abolition. Uh, these systems have clearly a, a very obvious racial history that cannot so easily be fixed. Thank you.
So, I'm Isabella Tibaba. I am Carla Mendez. I'm Evelyn Munoz. And our question is How does religion impact government functions and societal outcomes? So, in order to answer this question, we decided to take a look at two countries. The first is Mexico, where Catholicism is the main religion. And the second is Lebanon, where Islam and Christianity are the two main religions. So, we'll go ahead and start with Mexico. Um, so, Catholicism was first introduced to the region in the mid 16th century due to Spanish colonization. But by the mid 1800s, however, the church had become so powerful that changes were made to the constitution to separate the church and the state. However, Catholicism is still very prevalent in both Mexican society and politics to this day. As you can see from this graph, nearly four fifths of Mexicans. Identify as Catholic, making it the most prominent religion in the country by far. And this is a quote that explains what it's like to be a non believer in Mexico. I especially like the line that impregnates everything my worldview, my view of politics, my view of women, of education, of literature, because I think it does a really good job explaining just how prevalent Catholicism is. Okay, so we're going to start off with the religion part of it. Um, maybe not this quick. So she is Virgin Mary. Um, she first appeared in 1531 with the uh, Spanish colonial administration coming. Um, the weird thing is about this is that she appears to an indigenous guy in the same spot that uh, they used to adore their Catholic god named uh, Donatito. This could be argued that it was a way to encourage the replacement of Lady Guadalupe from their original god. So then uh, we also have these Catholic priests. They were very um, uh, active in the independence. They caused a lot of the revolution to be going on. If you look at Mexico right now, they're all over um, the churches, the streets, school names, everything. Okay, so we're now in the constitution of Mex Mexican federal states. They were divided between two strong central governments. Uh, well, two factions either you were federalist or you were a strong, strong central government. The federalist were those who were liberals and adhered control of a conservative Mexico City. Meanwhile, the conservative centralist. Where those who control the role of tradition and they drew allegiance to the clergy, they were normally like military people and those who were landowners. Um, in the new constitution, they took uh, Catholicism as an official and unique religion. It says there specifically that just laws and prohibits the exercise of any other. So they basically just wanted that religion in the country. Uh, fast forward a couple of years of that format. So there were these three uh, liberal expatriates called Juanes. Mexico before and Benito Juarez. Benito Juarez, it, um, well, all of them, they wanted to bring in this liberal revolution going on to Mexico, so they voted for Santana, the current president, to be in a weak spot. They ended up taking over and they made um, come Fort the president, Benito Juarez, the Minister of Justice. And once they were um, in office, they did these two laws called Ley Juarez and Ley Lerdo. Ley Juarez basically abolished Juegos, which were like special exemptions given to the church and civil court cases. And they later basically told the Mexican church uh, of Catholicism that if you have other land that you're not using for religious purposes, you must sell it. These laws were always enforced. Uh, the Constitution of 1857 brought a lot of um, controversy, uh, especially from the abolishment of that law uh, with the courts. The church did not like this, so they shook back. They caught attention for the religion and courts. So uh, the church began to excommunicate all their civil officials who to support to the constitution. Civil war erupted and Comfort went into exile after his promise, after his compromise fell. Prince of Wales took place and he actually became the president. Um, there was a lot of controversy going on and the opponents were put into jail. People were shot. Um, in the end, uh, the conservatives elected a new president called General Zaduwa and they captured Mexico City and set up a competing regime. But the real government was moved to Veracruz. And they actually did this uh, decree in 1859 where they uh, annulled all the Catholic um, marriages, well, any church marriages, and they confiscated a lot of uh, land that the church owned. So, to safeguard any future bloodshed, they also um, added to that form of the Constitution of 1857 uh, the start of the church and state independence. So, um, separation of church and state. That began right there. So, uh, fast forward a couple of years, uh, there was a peasant uprising called the Crusader Rebellion from 1926 to 1929. Here, they had this very liberal president called Cosaco Calles, 
he basically uh, got rid of a lot of the, uh, well, he enforced retaliation on the church. He made everything a lot more difficult for people to go to church. The door at one point, the church got mad and they began to strike and seize all religious services. Um, in the end, the US ambassadors were able to help this conflict. So now we'll continue with the Um, so, really brief history of religion in Lebanon. Uh, the first instance of religious involvement in government was in the 1926 Constitution, and the primary principles of that Constitution was freedom of conscience, freedom of exercising religious rights, and the elimination of political factions. Um, so, there's 18 recognized sects in Lebanon and three main religions, which are Sunni Muslim, Shia Muslim, and Christianity. And those are about all a third of the general population. And so in the constitution, it was written to have proportional representation in the government of these different religions with the intention to eventually eliminate um, sectarian politics, but all it did was just solidify them. All right, so during the 1940s, Lebanon was released from the French mandate, which allowed them to create their own independent country. This meant that they had to start deciding what they would do with their country and make their own independent decisions. Right off the bat, there started to be clashes between Christians and Muslims over ideology, specifically what the national identity in Lebanon should be like. Uh, the Christians wanted a close relationship and ties with the West, and they wanted to identify themselves as Lebanese. Muslims, on the other hand, wanted a close relationship with the rest of the Arabic lands, and they wanted to identify themselves as Arabic. The National Pact came about as a compromise between these two ideologies, which accepted the Arabic identity of Lebanon, and it also accepted the Christian proposal, proposal of Lebanon as its own independent and separate country. So this was part of the National Pact. It basically designated world and Christian beliefs or religious beliefs to each of the political positions. So according to the National Pact, the Lebanese Prime Minister has to be Sunni Muslim, the Christian, the President has to be a Maronite Christian, and the Speaker of Parliament has to be Shia Muslim. The Take Agreement came about after the Civil War, which happened in 1975 due to pressures from the Palestinian and Israeli conflict and uh, political division over how to handle the situation of Palestine. Palestinian refugees coming into the country. Eventually, the Take Agreement came about as a way to end the war. This amended constitutional powers and it was supposed to eventually lead to free sectarian restrictions, but it never really did. So, according to the Take Agreement, this is what the parliament is, was like for Lebanon. So, there'd be a 50 50 percent of parliament's total seats between the Muslims and Christians. Out of 28 seats in total, 64 seats for each side. This breaks it down even further between the different kinds of Muslims and Christians. The current state, due to the sectarianism now present in Lebanon, there are also some roads which encourage nepotism and hegemony within the political system, and it gave way to issues, for example, in employment. Instead of focusing on who could do the job the best and hiring people, people were instead focusing on building quotas for religious people to have in a specific career. Uh, one of the quotes from the protesters who were protesting this system is take this expired, it will stop the war, it doesn't work. Uh, the current state, right now the country is in the middle of an economic collapse. Uh, protesters have taken to the streets ever since 2019 when the government placed a taxes on WhatsApp and the uh, protests have continued ever since. Uh, here is an article about from about a month ago. And so um, in conclusion, we believe that based off of Mexico's past and Lebanon's present, religious involvement in government is not a good idea since it can result in fragile systems of government and divisions within society. Um, 
my name is Jordan Benning. I'm Jamie Martinez. I'm Colton Ridd. This is PTSD, the Soldier's Mental Battle. Our research question was, what are the social and systemic barriers preventing the diagnosis and treatment for PTSD in American veterans slash military members? PTSD is defined by the National Institute of Mental Health as a disorder that develops in some people who have experienced a shocking, scary, or dangerous event. The American Psychiatric Association defines it as a disorder that may occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a tra traumatic event such as a natural disaster, serious accident, terrorist act, war combat, war combat, rape, or have been threatened with death, sexual violence, or serious injury. What can cause PTSD? PTSD, although many people connected to war veterans, it can happen to just about anyone. Here are some of the reasons people are diagnosed with PTSD. Combat exposure, exposure physical abuse, sexual violence, physical assault, someone threatening you, or an accident. Trauma is hard to define for everyone because trauma can be different for everyone. According to the American Psychiatric Association, PTSD affects approximately 3.5% of U.S. adults every year. About uh, one in 11 people will be diagnosed with PTSD. Also, women are twice as likely to have PTSD even more than men. Symptoms of PTSD. So first, we're going to start with the negative impact on your thought and mood. Um, having negative thoughts about yourself and other people around you. Then there's intrusive memories, which are recurring unwanted memories of the event. You have physical and emotional changes, which is when you get scared really easy and you're always checking your surroundings for anything dangerous. And then there's finally avoidance, which is finding yourself actively or subconsciously trying not to think of the event. And then you're avoiding people, places, or even things that you used to like think of the event. Diagnosis of PTSD. The diagnosis of PTSD requires exposure to an event involving an actual or possible chance of death, violence, or even serious injury. A doctor will likely do these, do these steps before diagnosing. They will perform a physical test, which includes checking for medical issues, perform a psychological test, which includes discussion of symptoms and signs of the event and what led to the event, as well as looking at the criteria from the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental orders, the DSM-5, and that's made by the American Psychiatric Association. The social barriers that face the veteran. When a soldier is sent to basic training in the military, they are taught and trained to be tough physically, but also mentally. They must be strong mentally because of the horrible things they will come encounter during their time of service. Although this mental toughness may benefit them during their time of service, they can harm them when they get back home. Many soldiers can't accept the fact that they may be suffering from PTSD because of the terrible things that they lived through and survived. Too many of mental health disorder can't compare to fighting out on the battlefield, even though it faces the greatest, poses the greatest threat to their personal life. Soldiers may recognize that they have symptoms, but just see it as a small scar left in their service. Ultimately, it can be categorized as a danger, a stigma, of military risk. This is Colonel Greg Gatson's experience with PTSD. Army Colonel Greg Gadsden was blown out of his passenger seat by a roadside bomb. He was in Baghdad, 2007. His physical injuries were so severe, doctors assumed he would suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, but he was too embarrassed to accept it. Why did you find it so hard to really believe that you had post-traumatic stress? It was not something that I could identify with. You know, as, a, as an athlete, as a as an officer, as a leader, we're trained to, to override pain, to override uh, doubt. Both his legs were amputated above the knee. He had permanent nerve damage, limited function in his right arm. Gadsden underwent 22 surgeries. He was in rehab for 18 months. His abilities greatly diminished from his college glory days. Gadsden played football at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. A co-captain and outside linebacker powering through was in his DNA. Lee Gadsden, right here, he's got terrific football instinct. Football player, 
a leader. I mean, we're all these sort of almost stereotypes, right? Of like right. the tough guy, all capital letters. And you can say macho if you want. Yeah, to yeah I'll say macho. I mean, you know, how much of your reluctance to get help was that this macho stereotype was kind of going to stand in the way of that? Probably 100% of it. I mean, um, every tough challenge in my life I fought through, and, and that's what I was doing. So I was committed to, to fighting through it again and without help. I was very surprised that of the one in five people who get diagnosed with post traumatic stress disorder, what half of them don't get treatment. Right. A massive number just do what you did. Right. Yeah, up there. Stigma surrounding post-traumatic stress disorder sometimes discourages vets from seeking treatment. Oh boy. Good. From the video, you can see how Colonel Gadsden said that PTSD isn't a thing that he can relate to because of his time as a, a soldier and his experience as an athlete. This is important because it shows that it's a prevalent issue among those who are taught to be tough and strong. Access to mental health care for veterans. For most veterans and most readily available form of mental health, if they choose to reach out, is through the VA. Other than the VA, there's only 13% of private psychologists that can give adequate mental health to combat veterans. Another factor of limiting access is that about half of the counties in the US do not even have any qualified mental health professionals practicing, making it very, making it especially hard for veterans trying to reach out and get help that they need. We know that in their response to a question about the VA and the help that they provide will primarily be a negative response due to the fact that there are around 19 million veterans in the US, while only 9 million in my pocket receiving any VA benefits. This statistic is most likely due to the combined pressure, stigmas, and various veterans face in thinking and trying to seek mental health. Some more systemic barriers that veterans face, structural through the military. The stigma that veterans believe they'll be punished for seeking mental health, like having clearances removed, being devoted, and getting kicked out of their units by their superiors. Uh, access. Many veterans have physical barriers that are stopping them from seeking help, such as simply facilities are too far away, facility allergy policies, bureaucratic obstacles, user friendliness, and general public stigmas that make them cautious about losing their jobs. Women veterans also 13 and and 38% of women veterans experience rape during their service, and the VA and the military has come up with strong programs to combat this issue. The combat trauma and sexual trauma experienced by women veterans strongly increases their chances of being diagnosed with PTSD. And cultural populations also experience systemic barriers. Despite high PTSD years, certain groups are still not seeing as well including African-Americans, Latinos, Asians, and Native Americans. 85% of Native Americans and Latinos felt VA caregivers know little about ethnic cultures, and 79% felt that VA caregivers have problems talking with ethnic veterans. Also, the fact that there's a scarcity of minority mental health care providers discourages certain minorities from seeing African-Americans and Latinos also feel they're letting down their families and channeling themselves for seeking help. This is both from, from both minorities from the other healthcare providers. Now there's treatments for PTSD. There's a couple different types of treatments, but the number one type would have to be psychotherapy, which is also known as talk therapy. And when combined with medication, this seems to help a lot of people. So first there's cognition therapy, which is talk therapy, and it helps you recognize and understand the ways of thinking. Then you have exposure therapy, which is behavioral therapy, and helps one face both the situation and the others. Then you have eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. You use exposure therapy and a series of eye movements to help you process the traumatic memories. Then there's medications like antidepressants, anti-anxiety medication, and prednisone. In conclusion, veterans in the United States face many barriers in their search for help with PTSD, such as mental signals, physical access, structure of the military, gender, race, and culture. The fact that only 9 million out of 19 million veterans received help is a statistic that we believe needs to drastically change to reduce this inequality.
Good afternoon. Our topic today will be pharmaceuticals and marketing in America. Your presenters today will be Rio Patel, Jamie Gilford, and Sally Beth Brown. I want you to think for a second. How much money do you think the average American spends annually on medication? The U.S. alone spent over $300 billion on medication last year in 2020. And Americans spend more on prescription drugs than anyone else in the world. And the average American spends about $1,200 per person per year on prescription drugs. And over the years, there has been a large increase in how much Americans spend on medicine this year. And drug spending in the U.S. is at an all-time high right now. We will continue to go out. And we'll be comparing U.S. drug expenditures to Canadian expenditures on drug prices. So also think about how much you think Canadians spend on medication each year. The average Canadian spends $450 a year on prescription drugs. And as you can see from our chart over here, there's a large price gap between drug prices in the U.S. and Canada. So, seeing these spending discrepancies, we narrowed our research question down to why and how American pharmaceutical companies use marketing practices to maximize their profits. Okay, so how did we answer this question? So our methods basically we started off by researching and noticed how many American pharmaceuticals and why they maximize their profits so much. The next thing that we did was research some marketing practices that they use to maximize their profits. And then the last thing that we did was propose solutions to alleviate some of these negative discrepancies. So we wanted to start with the why, and so we're researching what the biggest motive is, and we found that to be money. So American drug prices are about four times more than prices in comparable countries. Um, there was a research study done on hospitals in America, and it found that hospitals market prices anywhere from 100 to 999 percent, and the largest chunk of these hospitals, which was about 20 percent, marked up the prices from 200 to 299 percent. Um, in Canada, insulin costs around a tenth of what it does in America for the same formula and size of a vial. And everything's the same, so the price is different. Um, from the year 2002 to 2019, American spendings went up by around $300 billion on American. Okay, so now that we talked about why many pharmaceutical companies maximize their profits for money, we're going to talk about some of the marketing practices that they use. We're going to start off with packaging. Okay, so how many of you have ever used eye drops? Okay. Yeah, a lot of you. Okay, and then how many times have you ever overfilled your eyes accidentally, put too much, and then you have like medication all over your face? A lot of times, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's actually not your fault. Um, many, drug many drug companies that create, manufacture, and sell eye medications in a bottle actually design it so that the typical eye drop is larger than what the average human eye can hold. Um, some eye drops are so worse that if they were filled every time you took one, you would just throw another one in the trash. So why did they do this? Well, more money. Um, the more you waste product, the more, the more you'll need it. So then you'll go back into the store and buy more, which means you'll get more back with it. So we know that there have been motivators money, but it's also important to note that companies need money. So um, they needed to pay employees um, for their research and development to make new drugs or improve existing drugs and to maintain maintain the factories that they get the medications in. So yes, they are getting a profit, but they're also um, using the money to keep the company going. So another way that um, they use marketing is through television commercials. So we have an example of one of these here. Has asthma pushed you into a small lane? Are your asthma treatments just not enough? Then see what can open up for you. With Vistemra, it is not a steroid or an hanger. It is not a rescue medicine or for other eosinophil conditions. It's an add-on injection for people dwelling up with asthma driven by eosinophils. Nearly 7 out of 10 adults with asthma may have elevated eosinophils. Vistemra is designed to target and remove eosinophils, a key cause of asthma. It helps to prevent asthma attacks, improve breathing, and can reduce the need for oral steroids like prednisone. The 
instead of make us allergic reactions, get help right away if you have a song on your face, mouth, and tongue, or trouble breathing. Don't stop your asthma treatments unless your doctor tells you to. Tell your doctor if you have a parasitic infection or your asthma worsens, and it can smoke from the neck Could you be living a bigger life? Ask an asthma specialist about the Okay. So, um, this television commercial is interesting to note because America is one of the only countries that uses this marketing practice. Um, TV is very prevalent in our society and everyone watches TV. So I know I've seen a lot of these commercials um, and I found it shocking that we're one of the only countries that does this because it seems like I've just been around it forever. So I've always thought that that's how every country worked. Um, also in the video, it's important to note that the people seem to be living like a super happy life. And like, if you take this medicine, then your life will be Amazing, which is just like a really interesting marketing tactic to think about because drugs are necessary things that people need to live, but they're kind of the marketing is being used like you need to buy this, and it's more like consumer based rather than like the market. Okay, so many problems with the pharmaceutical companies. What are some solutions? So we three came together and thought of three solutions. So the first one was would be to have more government interference. Um, having more government interference with pharmaceutical companies would allow maximum selling prices to be placed on drug companies, and then this would um, then lead to American drug prices being comparable to like other countries. Um, the next thing that we um, thought of was to create better packaging of course, so, there's, so that there's no more waste. And then the last thing that we thought of was we focus on drug companies both in providing care and so just focusing on the profit and the money. Questions? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lindsay Lopez. My name is Mary Moutine. And I'm Abby Yelkin. And today we're going to be talking to you guys about the organ transplantation system and its correlation with wealth. So beginning with our methodology in order to reach our conclusions, we conducted our research through a scientific lens and included information from several peer-reviewed journals accessed by the College through uh, websites such as Yale and Statistica. And we also prioritized papers from credible universities and institutions that um, specialize in research. So the first topic we'll head on before we figure out its correlation with socioeconomic status is how exactly does the organ transplant system work? So for our research, we decided to focus on the United Network of Organ Sharing as it is the most prevalent in America. UNOS has a pretty specific step-by-step -step process of how people can get transplants. This starts with acceptance as a candidate and then transitions into the list screening, which focuses on blood type, height, weight, and other medical factors for matching organs. This then transitions to base to geography basis and children. Children are prioritized in organ donations because the organs are smaller and they need organs faster because of this. And geography is prioritized because an organ must be transplanted at least three hours after it is removed from the body, uh, which means that if you are closer to an organ transplant center, you will get an organ faster. All right, so we began by examining US transplant demand by organ, and we found that kidneys were most significant and in highest demand with 91,834 individuals on the transplant waiting list for a kidney in September 2020. But further research, um, um, we found that in 2020, there were only 11,108 kidneys donated in the entire year, meaning there's a significant supply and demand deficit in the organ donation and transplantation system. It's also important to recognize how much an organ transplant will cost. The cheapest organ on average is $32.5,000, which is a cornea, and the most expensive is $1.6 million. This shows how expensive an organ can be, and while um, insurance in America usually covers the cost of organs, this brings us to the issue of what about the individuals who don't have health insurance or premiums to cover the cost of organ transplantation? So this question led us to understand the issue that there are immense perceivable impacts of wealth on organ transplantation recipients. So consider these two questions. What does socioeconomic status allow for in America? And when you think of a high socioeconomic status, what comes to mind? So we had also pondered about these questions, which led us to develop the project Go Love 
To what extent does the socioeconomic status of Americans correlate with the acquisition of organs in the organ chain? In defining socioeconomic status, we went to the American Psychological Association, and it states that the social standing or class of an individual or group, often measured as a combination of education and common occupation, is socioeconomic status. And we found in Pew Research that um, in 2018, high socioeconomic status was um, in median range $187,000. $187,872. Median socioeconomic status was $78,442. And low socioeconomic status was $25,624, which is at the poverty line. Keeping this in mind, socioeconomic status correlates highly with opportunity. Those with a higher socioeconomic status have better education, better health care, more influence in politics, and more access in society in general. In contrast, those with a lower socioeconomic status have poor health care, as the jobs they usually have do not offer them health care or health care premiums, which also means that they have a higher level of health care in poverty. So in order to further investigate this issue, we look at a few case studies, and our first is from Dr. Raymond Gibbons with Columbia University. Here's a video of his research. We as physicians have a responsibility to minimize the impact of socioeconomic status on healthcare access. This study was done um, because um, we know that there are uh, tremendous differences in uh, uh, access to transplantation across the country. Um, we wanted to know about the impact of a particular policy called multiple listing, um, which allows people to place themselves on the waiting list of, uh, of different transplant centers simultaneously. And so what we found is, is that um, people who engage in multiple listing, um, they, they generally do live in areas that have higher median incomes. Um, they have higher education, they have multiple markers, of higher socioeconomic status. All right, so to summarize Dr. Randy Gibbons' study, um, he did a longitudinal heart transplant study from 2000 to 2013. And he concluded that um, zip codes with multiple listing patients were actually associated with higher median incomes than those on only one um, transplant waiting list. And therefore, we came to the conclusion that there is indeed a correlation between high socioeconomic status and having that ability to get on more than one list and being able to travel to places um, where those listing areas are. Hence, faster than the so similar to the study in the United States, a study was done in Sweden that was investigating socioeconomic status and access to kidney transplants. And so the conclusion from this study is that socioeconomic status would if inequalities do exist in the system, and people who have higher socioeconomic statuses had better access to multiple listings, like the, the previous study. So breaking off of that um, study in Sweden, we actually found an American study called the Interplay of Socioeconomic Status on kidney transplant access and outcomes. And researchers actually found that socioeconomic status not only has to do with the actual transplant, but the complexities behind the transplant as well, including seeking treatment, evaluation, and the listing. And it was found that Medicare-only patients have a 78% less chance of receiving a um, listing than people who have private insurance. As well as in three years after listing, Patients with the highest socioeconomic status have almost 30% more chances of receiving a live donor organ than compared to the 13.5% chance for lowest socioeconomic status. And overall, it's found that the highest or the fourth um, quartile of socioeconomic status was associated, associated with a low risk of weightless mortality, meaning um, death while they're waiting for. And as you can see from this graph, which is from the same um, study, there is a 10 to 15 percent disparity from the years um, one to five um, after listing between the first class socioeconomic status and fourth class socioeconomic status. In addition, as shown by these graphs from the National um, Institute of Biotechnology Information, the, the individuals with the lowest socioeconomic status were half as likely to travel to admission to meaning they would not get access to any organ transplantation. In contrast, those in third and fourth socioeconomic status quartiles um, had greater chances of receiving deceased donor transplants, and really any 
many most of them are so you all know Steve Jobs, the former CEO of Apple, and there's actually a controversy about him because he received a liver transplant in 2009. And many believe that he was able to receive his transplant faster than others because he was the sickest patient. However, he was one of the sickest patients, but he also had the high socioeconomic status being a multimillionaire. And he also had access to transportation because of these benefits from a socioeconomic status. So he was able to come to that hospital faster than any other patient. So basically, keeping this in mind, he did have these benefits because of his socioeconomic status and not just because he was a sick patient. So for our big conclusions that we got from doing this research, our first one is the socioeconomic status of American citizens and access to organs from the transplant system highly correlate in a manner that often goes unrecognized. In addition, socioeconomic status is associated with patient mobility, receive proper care, receive and treatment following their transplantation, and location is very heavily related to socioeconomic status. And overall, our main conclusion was that a higher socioeconomic status allows for faster access to organs due to the multiple risk factors. So, what solution can we propose for this problem? So I feel that our solution begins um, in the healthcare field itself, applying accessible and affordable care to all in both rural and urban communities, and as well as ensuring that policies are created to avoid socioeconomic inequities in all organ transplant networks by inciting the final rule, which um, leads to the organ procurement and transplantation network aiming to maintain a quality review system. Since we don't have time for questions, Thank you. Hello, I'm Natalie Burton. I'm Emma Montero. And I'm Emmy Miller. And this is our presentation on how cults control members in the cult mindset. I do just want to give a disclaimer and a trigger warning that we do talk about suicide towards the end of our presentation. Um, we started with the research question, how do cults use psychological man manipulation to control members and how does that behavior lead to extreme loyalty? Uh, so when we first started researching this topic, we had to use around 26 resources. Uh, we found that there's not a lot of information out there on cult conformity specifically, so we really had to look at cults and conformity separately to find similarities. Uh, from there, we looked at some of the major, most prominent cults uh, in our history and found similarities between them. Uh, we also used keywords and found that limitations. Uh, most research on cults is anecdotal from survivors, as most of the prominent cults are no longer around to study or were very private in their methods during their prime. This leads us to ask, what is a cult? A cult is a particular structural type of religious institution. Membership is predominantly lower class and usually gained through conversion, often during an emotional crisis that joining the cult is seen to resolve. Unlike other religious institutions, cults tend to be short lived, primarily because of their social, social structure. An informal, loose organization formed around a single leader's charismatic authority, highly emotional services that lack a formalized ritual. This is a great definition because it talks about the, the way the structure of a cult works. However, not all cults are religious. Um, when going about this question, we decided to start with the psychological possibilities. Because cults themselves are hard to study, we started with an, the idea of the group mindset. These were the three ideas that we found. The first is group think. This is when an individual uh, accepts the viewpoint of the perceived consensus of the group. The second is conformity. The adjustment of one's opinions, judgments, or actions to be more consistent with the opinions, judgments, or actions of other people. Conformity can also include outward compliance and private acceptance. This is why we see some more traditionally intelligent members of cults, such as the uh, Harvard graduate that can be found in the Branch Davidian group. Uh, and the final is in group favoritism. A 1970s study showed that even when people are assigned to groups based on obscure requirements, they still show favoritism towards the members of their group. This can be problematic because the in-group of a cult is based on something that you hold highly valuable, such as your core beliefs or religion. The more meaningful your, 
your core beliefs and your in-group, the more your favoritism you're going to show. Uh, we started with the more physical aspects in the, with the idea of manipulation. Uh, cults maintain the agenda and beliefs of cult leaders through manipulation. The more extreme the beliefs, and the more convincing the teachers and leaders need to be. Uh, so this leads us to our first aspect of man manipulation, which is the idea that the world is ending. Uh, many cults use the end of the world as a way to gain control of people. So it also ties into groupthink, getting one idea uh, in the heads of all followers. So the first uh, example of this would be Jonestown. Jim Jones was under investigation and was close to being arrested. Uh, and the members feared that their world would be over. Uh, the children of God believed in earthquake fever. They thought a massive earthquake would hit California. Uh, it would fall into the ocean. They also believed in the Christmas monster comet and thought that would also come to destroy Earth. Uh, and Heaven's Gate was very similar. They also believed in the hail Bob comet. Uh, they thought it was going to recycle planet Earth. Uh, and in that, they believed that their souls would leave their bodily containers, join an alien spacecraft behind the comet, and take them to the gates of heaven. Targeting the young and vulnerable, there are many cults that target people who are at risk or like dropping out of high school or have already dropped out of high school. While not all of these people are necessarily young, most of them are not older because most people who are older have like good stability to their finances. So, for example, David Byrd would reach out to people who have a lot of economic hardships, and he would pull them into their into his cult because they were vulnerable and they were at risk to join the cult. Um, one of the defining aspects of a cult is the cult leader themselves. They're typically kind and charismatic, accepting good public speakers, and believe that they have some sort of God-given authority. For example, Marshall Applewhite of the Heaven's Gate book group thought he was the reincarnate of Jesus and had the mind of God. And similarly, uh, Jim Jones of Jonestown believed that he was the Messiah. Now, this might to us seem crazy, but one of the more appealing draws of uh, Jones's group was that the idea of racial equality. And him and his wife were actually the first white couple in Indiana to adopt a black child. Uh, the ne next aspect of manipulation tends to be a more physical one, and that's the uh, control of property and personal income. Uh, our example for this is Jonestown. Jim Jones really alienated uh, members from the outside world and their families so that he was the sole provider of their every need. Upon arrival to their compound in Guyana, members were forced to give up all passports and money, so they had no way of making life outside of the cult. And then the compound was surrounded by armed guards, convicted or um, escape members had it feeling more like a concentration camp rather than a community. And this also feeds into isolation. Uh, like I said, the Jonestown compound was in the middle of the jungle of Guyana. Uh, people were forbidden from receiving outside news. James, Jones considered it lies, and really coined the term fake news. And then he often manipulated members with blackmail and humiliating beatings, inciting fear. And as we know, if you're beaten and ashamed and embarrassed, you're not going to reach out to family and friends or help. You're going to really internalize that. The Branch Davidians are, it's a great cult to give an example of a cult that used to commit family bonds to manipulate their members. David Grush persuaded the cult's women that they should bear his children to further the house of David, creating offspring who he prophesied would one day rule earth with him. He created polygamy to have the members of the cult have this in-depth family bonds in their minds before they would consider leaving the cult. Uh, because of these measures of manipulation, members participated in what we were calling acts of extreme loyalty. They were so convinced of their beliefs and so desperate to escape their perceived threat that many groups saw mass suicide as the only answer. Um, for example, uh, Heaven's Gate, as the Hale-Bopp Comet approached Earth, they consumed phenobarbital mixed with applesauce or pudding and vodka in order to leave their bodily containers and ascend to the UFO that would take them to Heaven. Um, though a little bit more complicated, the Branch Davidians also committed suicide. Uh, after a 51-day standoff with the FBI, they made, no, after a 51-day standoff, they the fire burnt down 
their compound. They had barrels of hay doused with gasoline surrounding the compounds, knowing that when the tactical gear by the FBI was launched, their fire, their compound would burn down. Uh, though some people had been released through previous negotiations, 76 members, including children and Koresh, died in, died in the compound. And finally, the more, the more well-known example would be Jonestown. Uh, because of a, a building pressure of an outside investigation of people being held against their will, they consumed cyanide and tranquilizers mixed with flavor aid in order to escape that pressure. This is where the term drink the Kool-Aid was actually originated from. Uh, so when we look at why does this matter, why is it prevalent to society today, uh, we really look at that in three parts. Prevention, uh, if we know enough in order to prevent you or others from joining uh, potentially dangerous groups will limit that harmful activity. Recognition, if you know the aspects of a cult and ID them as such, you can ensure that they don't go unnoticed, especially if they seem dangerous or harmful. And then understanding. If we can understand how they function, we'll be better prepared to deal and interact with potentially dangerous groups, uh, therefore preventing harm to themselves or other people. Uh, references. Hello, my name is Abigail Lapp. I'm Joanne Lewis. And I'm Devin And for our cornerstone presentation, we will be discussing linguistic discrimination. So, to start off, linguistics itself is the study of human speech, including the units, nature, structure, and modification of language. Now, linguistic discrimination is the set of ideologies and structures which are used to legitimate an unequal division of power and resources between linguistic groups. A dialect is a regional type or variety of language, and a sociolect is a variety of a language that's used by a specific social group. As to why you should care, linguistic discrimination usually is not held to the same standard as other forms of prejudice, despite it having many of the same effects in people's personal and professional lives. Therefore, placing more emphasis on this area can help us with this issue. So this is the question that we use to guide our research um, into linguistic discrimination. And the way that we chose to address this was by looking at two specific cases. So that is African-American vernacular English and wanted to find a stereotypically gay voice. We ended up finding way more information than we could ever possibly present in a span of 10 minutes, so we just chose some of the most relevant sources to present today. The dialect we chose to focus on is African American Vernacular English, also abbreviated as AABE. This, this is a dialect of American English that's commonly associated with, associated with or used by North American Black people. Now, despite ongoing research and a lot of recent spikes in today's society, and with having discussions regarding AABE, many sources were still older than 10 years old, which isn't preferable. And as a result, this kind of raised some questions on their relevance to today. Another limitation that we had was the response bias towards the standard American English dialect being perceived as the default or neutral dialect. And some linguists also stated that research about auditory discrimination could be challenging to monitor due to the lack of visual cues. And of course, when it came to time, we only had a limited amount of time to research everything. So this resulted in us being able to cover less information than we would have preferred. Now moving on. In this study by Cornell, Isari, and Law, PhDs in linguistics, there was a trilingual speaker who was familiar with AD, Chicago English, and Standard American and standard American English. The participant was told to call prospective landlords in five different locales. Each call started with the same introductory phrase, but had different dialects for each one. These tables show these tables show that there are distinct patterns when comparing the population of each locale of confirmed appointments to new apartments. AV was shown to have a lower number of confirmed, appoint apartment, confirmed appointments compared to standard American English. And traditionally, such majority white locales, such as Woodside, 
and Pololta. Both have the strongest bias against non standard dialects. Contrary to this, Oakland, an area with the highest percentage of African Americans, had a VE hold the highest number of confirmed, confirmed appointments. <laughs> These results conclude that auditory cues were a factor in purposeful discrimination cases in housing. But this discrimination is also present in courtrooms where the speaker is visible as well as audible. Trayvon Martin was a 17 year old African American high schooler who was unarmed and fatally shot by George Zimmerman during a physical altercation. In Martin's case, there were no jury members who were fluent in AADE during John Hill's testimony. Therefore, they, quote, missed or misunderstood crucial elements in her testimony, end quote, according to a professor named John Rickford. Furthermore, Rickford stated that John Hill is, quote, fluent in a variety of English that's been in existence for centuries. She speaks in a very systematic, regular variety of AADE, end quote. So essentially, this unfamiliarity that the white jury members had with AADE and their negative attitudes that they had towards it resulted in Nokel unfairly being perceived as ignorant and unintelligent. And because of that, they thought that she wasn't a credible witness, even though this wasn't necessarily the case. Now we will show a clip from Rachel's testimony in Martin's case. Okay, a little get off, get off. Yeah, I actually when the fight happened, I had told him. Before I just shot off, he asked me, did you hear when it was fighting going on? Did you hear something was going on between the fight? No, he did not ask me that. The state asked me that. From this, we can tell that Chief Jotel speaks in a very consistent speech pattern that follows the rules of ABE as shot inside. But nonetheless, Jotel is still unfairly perceived as unintelligent due to her not speaking standard American English. That the white that the white jurors speak. So the associate likely chose to focus on this presentation is gay and lesbian voices, which is in fact the term that linguists choose to use to describe the voices that and uh, language that is typical of homosexual individuals. Um, so the limitations and biases of this. Um, so even though this is an international issue, almost all the studies we were able to focus entirely on Europe and North America. Um, additionally, a lot of these studies focus more on gay men than on lesbian women or any kind of gender non-conforming individuals. Um, and again, there was the limitation of time. So kind of the foundational understanding that we have to have here is that sexual orientation can be detected through voice. Um, all recent studies seem to agree on this, at least all the ones that we were able to find. Um, and the older studies that don't agree on this tend to argue that people detect what's called gender atypicality through voice. So that means you're detecting characteristics of a person's voice that are typical of their gender. Um, and this leads to the same kind of stereotyping that detection of sexual orientation does. So, in this study from Dr. Benjamin Munson, we can see that uh, homosexual speakers are rated as more homosexual and less gender typical, so masculine or feminine, than their heterosexual counterparts, and also the gay men are generally rated more strongly as homosexual than as not being masculine, which is indicative of um, perceiving sexual orientation independently from gender atypicality. Now, multiple studies have shown that there's significant stereotyping of gay men, especially by straight men, as shown in this study from Dr. Soli, which asked listeners to rate speakers on a scale of one to five for four different characteristics. Um, these matrices actually show that there's a statistically significant correlation between how gay a speaker is perceived to be and how effeminate or affected, um, meaning pretentious, he is perceived to be. And this is an example of the kind of negative stereotyping that we see um, with linguistics. Now, a surprising result came out of Italy and the United Kingdom, where again, Dr. Soli found that when adoption applicants called in 
to adoption agencies, they, those that sounded gay were discriminated against in Italy, but were actually preferred in the United Kingdom, which he attributes to pro-gay norms in the United Kingdom and anti-gay norms in Italy, which are supported by polls on same-sex adoption in this country. Um, another real-world example was a study in Sweden, which found that some, but not as much as we expected, discrimination does occur in hiring when the applicant's sexual orientation is known. Now, this wasn't a study into linguistic discrimination, but if we've accepted that sexual orientation can be detected from voice, this gives us an indication of the kind of discrimination we might be looking for. So, in the end, we clearly found that linguistic discrimination does exist in the cases of A, B, E, and gay voices in all spheres. Although discrimination based on gay voices seems to be somewhat less prevalent in countries like the UK, it still is pretty clear that both of these cases of linguistic discrimination are widespread in their respective areas. In general, our study of these two cases indicated that listeners' perceptions of so-called non-standard dialects and sociolects lead to negative stereotypes and negative social and professional outcomes for those individuals that do speak these dialects and sociologists. As for future, future research, further research needs to be done into intersectional issues and linguistic discrimination. Studies into gay voices may become more broadly than in the EU and US. Also, studies should expand on the speakers and listeners to include mono, bi, and tri dialect speakers. Um, here are many references. Um, and thank you for our slide template. Hi folks, welcome to one set of the presentations for Governor's School East Social Science. There's another set of presentations that are also going on in another space. Um, that is being conducted through Ferris' Zoom, if I remember correctly. So we will proceed with these, and uh, if you're watching live on Zoom and you want to duck in and duck out based on who's presenting and what you want to see, please feel free to do so. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Let's move on. Come on. YT material. What is YT material? You would ask you guys to shout out what you think, but we've been here for about four weeks and we knew what you guys would say. So we brainstormed what you might say and came up with family oriented, classy, feminine, respect to the body, pure, virgin. And then we would ask you to think about it and take an effective build pause. And hopefully you would be like, hmm, wonder why I associate these things with loss. Summer and I considered this and thought that respect might be poorly, which led us to pose this research question. Does the sexual manner in which a man views a woman influence how he is able to respect her? So in 1997, Fredrickson and Roberts provided the framework for understanding the socio-cultural context that sexually objectifies the female body. In society, many women are sexually objectified and treated as an object valued for its use. Sexual objectification occurs when a woman's body or body parts are singled out and separated from her as a person, and she is viewed primarily as a physical object of male sexual desire. Ford identified a dichotomy called Madonna Ford complex, which is the inability to maintain sexual arousal within a committed relationship. This is usually seen among men, and this complex is said to develop in men who see women in a black and white manner, as either pure and virginal or moral men. Within the context of the complex, respecting a woman and desiring her are mutually exclusive. And from a woman's perspective, sexual desire and morality are also mutually exclusive. Ford's conclusion of this was, where such men love, they have no desire, and where they desire, they cannot love. Here's an example taken from sex. And he reads porn, but when it comes to him and me, nothing. Madonna Ford. Hey, absolutely. Trace sees you as his virginal wife, not a sexual plaything. 
You're not going to get anywhere until you change how he sees you. Do that. Yes, you can. Come on, you're sexy. He should see you. You're something to see. So in this video, we see the character is stuck in what we would call the Madonna part of the dichotomy, meaning that her partner is not able to have any sexual desire for her. Men who have this complex have only seen women in two lights their entire lives as sex objects or motherly slash lovable figures. When they have a daughter, they have to make a new category. A daughter is the first woman a man respects in this light because he can't immediately categorize her as a Madonna or a whore. A man sees his daughter as an extension of himself, and he respects himself. We see this notion perpetuated in artistry, especially in Kanye's song, Violent Cries, where he explains that after he had his daughter, he saw women in a different light, as something to nurture and not conquer. His words, not mine. A study conducted by Suzanne Fitz, a psychologist at Princeton University, predicted that the changes in brain activity can show the way sexy images can shift the way men perceive women, from turning them into people to interact with into objects to act upon. This team put straight men into an MRI brain scanner where they showed them either close to women or more provocatively dressed women in bikinis with their faces blurred. When taking a memory test afterwards, the men best remembered images of women in bikinis. Brain scans from the MRI showed that when straight men looked at pictures of women in bikinis, activity, activity increased in the pre mortar cortex, which is involved in the urges to take action. This was the same area of the brain that usually lit up in anticipation of using tools. It was as if these men immediately sought to act upon these women's bodies. Scans of some men found that the part of the brain associated with empathy for other people, emotions, and wishes was shut down after looking at women's bodies. These men were reacting to these women as if they weren't fully human. On the slides behind me, we can see boys using their TikTok platform to express to women and girls on TikTok that if a boy actually likes you, he won't ask for sexual favors or bring up anything to do with sex, period. Studies have shown that in reality, this dichotomous view is what is causing these boys lack of relationship and sexual satisfaction. This conflict that is showing up more in men, which is probably due to the availability of social media, is hurtful to not only the men themselves, but women's ability to connect with their sexuality. While some women choose to remain a virgin in whatever you consider to be virginity, it's usually because of personal or religious reasons. However, some people are terrified that they'll lose value if they commit premarital sex. The, this complex only offers women two extremes to fit into, Madonna or whore, and this is extremely unrealistic and damaging to all. Because of all of this sexual objectification that takes place, women are not able to express their sexuality while also being seen as someone to respect. Sexuality is a complex idea and should be regarded as such. By holding more realistic beliefs concerning sexuality, sexual freedom will increase as well as the satisfaction of romantic relationships. This will lead to sexuality of women and the respect women deserve to become mutually exclusive instead of one dictating the other. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sally Sonal, I'm Jada Strickland, and our presentation is How to Identify a Coach. Our research question is, are there psychological patterns between serial killers that could be used as early detection for signs of violence? So, what defines a serial killer? According to the American Psychological Association, a serial killer is an individual who repeatedly commits murder to the Okay. Uh, yes, so she, um... She told me to change my name because I was showing as Arlene McCain, the parents are not supposed to view it. <laughs> so that's why I changed my name to <laughs> the <race book. laughs> Based on the, and we decided to use the 
we'll talk about serial killers, there's usually no one reason why they do what they do. So there's a combination of factors. And some of the other ones that we saw on serial killers were frequent, frequent moving during childhood, uh, previous convictions, rear leases, and major, major surgery slash illnesses. Um, so with this, we can potentially um, try to track um, disorders, um, abuse, and physical trauma, starting from early childhood. Um, by tracking this, we can um, potentially track um, the potential of an individual to commit crimes later in life, the preferred style or pattern of those crimes, and if the killer was aware they could control their actions at the time, which can help in um, the setting between two tools. Um, through this knowledge and this research, um, we can hope to understand the patterns of behavior and fit the future actions um, in the case of an active killer. Um, potentially um, give out more fair um, sentences and get help to those who need them. Um, and continue to research and discover the patterns of both killers in the past and those in the present. So in conclusion, there are certain express patterns and precursors of this in, in uh, person's youth that can lead to them becoming a serial killer in their adult life, but this is not a causation, it's merely a series of strong correlations and which leads into our issues and further research. So there were, it was hard to get accurate research um, because a lot of the infamous, infamous uh, serial killers were from the 70s and 80s and they didn't have the type of tools that we have now. Um, and we only studied US serial killers. It would be interesting to compare those to uh, different disorders in other countries. All right, so before we get started, I just want to give you all a quick content warning. Throughout our presentation, there will be mentions of sexual assault, rape culture, rape, as well as sexual misconduct. Um, we will not be going into any sort of specifics, but of course, please leave if you feel. So with that content warning, we are brought to our research question, which is how have K through 12 schools perpetuated the existence of rape culture? Um, raise your hand if you have ever been dress coded. Okay, you can go ahead and leave your hand up if the reason for your dress code was because you, what you're wearing was said to be distracting to male peers or male teachers. Okay, you can go ahead and put your hands down. This question is something that made me and Elena first aware of the objectification of women that is widely seen throughout schools and in our society as a whole. Um, and it wanted us to, it made us want to go deeper into this idea of rape culture in schools, which leads us to our definitions that we use for rape culture. So we have two definitions that we're gonna be referring to. The first one says rape culture is an environment in which rape is prevalent and in which sexual violence is normalized and excused in the media and pop culture. Um, rape culture is perpetuated through the use of misogynistic language, the objectification of women's bodies, and the glamorization of sexual violence, thereby creating a society that disregards women's rights and safety. The second definition we're using says rape culture perpetuates the belief that victims have contributed to their own victimization and are responsible, responsible for what has happened to them. All right, so why is this important? Well, rape culture is a concept that we see deeply ingrained within our school systems, whether it be the culture on men's sports teams, locker room talk, or the objectification of women students. Um, because of this, we formed our research question, which is how have K through 12 schools perpetuated the existence of rape culture? So let's move into our method. To begin our research, we asked ourselves, what really is rape culture? We 
We then compiled a variety of different definitions, as you saw in the previous slides, and we used those as our guide to what race culture is. We then started exploring the processes and policies through which schools enact that have the potential to contribute to, um, to a culture of um, so through our findings, we found many policies that high schools implement that could possibly contribute to rape culture, but in order to keep our research more narrow, we focused on two main subjects, which is the mishandling of sexual misconduct and sex education in the U.S. It's also important to mention that to keep this more narrow, we're focusing mostly on high schools because that is what we see affecting us most directly. All right, so let's move into our first concept, which is the mishandling of sexual misconduct. So this is an AAUW um, 2011 study that says 48% of students from grades seven through 11 report sexual harassment, while 79% of schools with grades seven through 11 have no reports of sexual harassment. So we see an obvious So I'm going to be talking a little bit about Title IX. If you do not know, Title IX is a federal civil rights law that protects students from discrimination on the basis of sex. So we're going to be looking a little bit about the implementation of Title IX. So despite Title IX being in existence, many times schools do not properly report instances of sexual misconduct, um, whether it be um, through like sweeping things under the rug or wanting to keep their um, school in a positive. So this is just talking a little bit more about the different reasons why um, some schools would want to sweep things under the rug. And also sometimes teachers and staff members are not properly educated on the ways you are supposed to report things and do not know the warning signs that you need to report. Um, so I have another question for you guys. Raise your hands if you feel as though you were given a holistic sex education in which you learned about consent, boundaries, and contraceptives. Okay, not very many hands, which leads us to the current state of sex ed in the U.S. Um, so sexual, sexual education is not required in all 50 states, um, and in many states where it is required, they're stressing abstinence-only sex education. Um, you can take a look at the key. Um, North Carolina is included in the abstinence-only. Um, but how did we get here? So we're going to look at a brief history of sex education in the U.S., Starting in the 1920s, it was first seen in schools, but it was mostly to inform soldiers about STDs. Um, and then later on throughout the 60s and 70s, um, many religious groups fought against sex education in schools, saying that it promoted promiscuity, promiscuity against in, amongst young children, sorry. Um, and then in 1981, under President Ronald Reagan, that the Adolescent Family Life Act was passed, and this became known as the Chastity Bill. This was federal funding for abstinence-only sex education. Um, this continued throughout the 90s, and the only time federal funding has been cut for abstinence-only was under Obama in 2009, but it was reinstated in 2018 under President Trump. Um, so because of this history of abstinence-only sex education, it leads us to what is comprehensive sex education and why is it important. And this can be seen most in the Netherlands. Um, here, sex education begins at a young age in elementary school, and it is followed and continued throughout high school. They have comfortable conversations with teachers, guardians, students, um, and they really do a good job of removing the stigma around sex education and teaching kids about consent. Um, comprehensive sex education covers many topics, um, including boundaries and consent, and implementing these methods would eradicate rape culture um, because it would lead to teaching kids that there are no gray areas when it comes to consent. It would teach children that consent must always be given in the affirmative, and it would overall remove the stigma surrounding talking about sex within our communities. Right, so that leads us into our logical conclusion. So when it comes to the mishandling of sexual misconduct, when schools do not properly report accusations, it allows a dangerous environment to ensue. 
thus leading to further rape culture. And when it comes to sex education, if there's a lack of information surrounding consent, many women are placed in unsafe environments when it comes to sexual situations. So through the mishandling of sexual misconduct and the lack, lack of proper sex education, our conclusion is that K through 12 schools have served to perpetuate rape culture. Um, we can't conclude that schools have started rape culture or that they are the root of rape culture, but our findings have shown that they serve to perpetuate it. Um, we also must mention our limitations with this project. So our sources, our resources have been confined to the Merrick Mile, and we have had a five-week time limit, so that could lead to some of our limitations, as well as a lack of reporting on, on many of these issues. Right, so in the future, we thought it would be really cool to see a study that explores the possible link between sexual misconduct in schools as well, um, in comparison to the way that schools do sex education. That is it for us. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Genevieve and this is my partner Sawyer and today we're going to be discussing safe injection sites and their effect on overdoses and drug uses within a community. So before we get started, we must give you a quick content warning. Throughout our presentation, we will be discussing drug use, drug overdoses, and drug-related deaths. However, we do primarily focus on ways in which to prevent overdoses. However, we know this may be an uncomfortable subject for some, so feel free to either leave the Zoom room or walk out of the room at any point throughout our presentation. So, I'm going to give you a quick introduction on the drug problem in America, as well as discussing what a safe injection site is, and Sawyer will take about your research and conclusion and our analysis that we created with the statistics. So, the rising drug problem in America. We all know it's a problem, so let's look at it. In 2000, we see a major increase in drug overdoses, because we see an increase in oxycontin and heroin flooding the market. In 2017, the U.S. declared an opioid epidemic and it was declared a public health emergency. Due to that, we have an increase in funding and we create public health campaigns such as the DARE program, which we all participated in in elementary school. From this graph, you can see that from 2010 to 2019, the number of drug-related overdose deaths almost doubled from 38,000 to 40,000 in a nine-year span. So, how do we fix the problem? There's a couple ideas that have been tossed around. One of them is the decriminalization or reduced sentencing for drug, for those who possess drugs, placing a harsher sentencing on those who deal drugs. Secondly, others argue that we need harsher sentencing for possessing the drug. Whereas, the um, more common approach that we're hearing now is the increasing the funding for um, health services and treating it with um, mental health services because addiction is a mental health disorder. However, we are focusing primarily on safe injection sites and our goal is to answer our research question, which is how do safe injection sites affect the health and long-term outcomes of drug users? So what is a safe injection site? That's the question we're here to answer. So a safe injection site is sometimes run by the government, but not entirely. And it is a supervised facility in which individuals are able to inject illicit drugs. Uh, they can get needles and syringes here, and there's also staff on hand to uh, treat an overdose if one occurs, as well as the goal is to lead us into a treatment program and recommend individuals to that route. So the four main goals, as I hit on previously, the first one is to decrease drug use, which is the big one that we are looking at. And um, that is by providing access to drug treatment programs. Secondly, we want to decrease the harm associated with drug use. And this occurs in two ways, which is decrease overdose deaths and provide health education on hygienic drug consumption. Third is to reduce publicly discarded needles. We can all walk around on the street and we see needles everywhere. And that's a major health concern due to number four, the spread of diseases such as HIV and hepatitis. So, where are safe injection sites? 
They're typically placed within areas of high drug use and overdose rates, and they're typically placed within urban settings. However, they're not they're in urban settings not because there's more drug use necessarily, but because there's more resources and they can cater to a larger audience. They're currently safe injection site located in Canada, Germany, and as well as many other places, and Sydney. And Sydney is where a lot of our research and statistics that Sawyer's going to get into come from, and it's called the Sydney MSC. So if you see that, that's what we're referencing. So as you probably noticed on that list of places that have safe injection sites, the United States was not on the list. So in 2018, a nonprofit called Safe House was funded with the intent of creating a safe injection site. This obviously caused some controversy and then went to court, and the Court of Appeals ruled that it broke what's called the Crack House Statute of 1986. This was when Reagan was in office, and this was the war on drugs era, and it said that um, a facility cannot be used for the use, storage, and selling of illicit drugs. And until this is repealed, the idea of a safe injection site being opened within the U.S. is slim to none. So now I'm going to pass it over to Sawyer for the research. Okay, so looking at our research, we really look through, uh, um, we look through various sources like Google Scholar, Statista, and ProPress Central to find the most relevant information on safe injection sites and how they will affect overdoses and rehab in the community. We compiled, compiled these things and sifted through them for the most relevant information to tell all of you about. Um, so beginning off, the first big statistic we were presented with when we looked at safe injection sites was that there have been zero overdose related deaths at any facility in existence currently. These facilities tend to stop overdoses, particularly related to heroin, I believe at the MSIC, 80% of heroin, every 80% of overdoses at the MSIC were because of heroin, which poses the largest risk, and they all all of them see overdose rates in and around the facility. We can see drops in overdose rates all around the facility, which leads us into here of the MSIC's actual overdose rate drop compares and ambulance attendances. So ambulance attendances in the King's Cross area where the MSIC is located as compared to New South Wales, the province in Australia as a whole. So we saw that there was a statistically significant drop of 7% more in King's Cross area as compared to New South Wales, but there was a large heroin shortage right before the creation of the MSIC. So there may be some um, you know, disparity in the statistics where we can see that maybe this area was more affected or things like that. But we can still see in the actual statistics is that there is a stability in the overdose rate as a whole with the introduction of the MSIC as compared to the toll of New South Wales, which has a more volatility. Um, and then we lead into the types of drugs used in there and have negative effects. So as I previously mentioned, heroin is the main overdose problem. But these facilities also allow for other drugs like cocaine and amphetamine, which do not pose as much of a large overdose rate, um, except if they're cut with things. The more present problem with cocaine and amphetamines is that they have lots of long-term problems. They're uppers, so you'll experience um, problems like varicose veins are actually something that you can do with the damage of the blood wall. Um, you can get brain hemorrhages, an increased risk of Parkinson's disease involved with amphetamines. There are huge problems with allowing these users to use these drug facilities because they could be using more and affecting themselves in more negative light. So looking at what the problems is, are with safe injection sites, or at least in the MSIC. So that overdoses in the MSIC were twice as, were twice as high as compared to the rest of the area. And that was because, as stated in the MSIC's own report, that the individuals may have been using more because of the medically trained staff on site. There's less of a risk for them to overdose and die so they can, you know, use more cocaine, use more amphetamines, use more heroin. So the risks associated with that can also increase. So looking at long-term outcome of drug users, we can see that initially, in a Swedish insect injection site, we can see that two users out of 15 in a Swedish study claimed that they had lowered their drug use because of the um, facility, but in comparison, five said that it worsened their habits, which could lead back to that they were using more and that they are in fact higher risk clients. Um, but in more positive light, we can see that Toronto facilities and Vancouver's facilities both caused an increase in 
uptake of detox facilities where it's providing a bridge for clients to go to detox facilities and better, better, better themselves and get over their overdose. And so more focused on the MSIC again, we can see that the MSIC provides treatment referrals at the initial registration of a client. So every single client is offered registration to a detox facility and about 14% have accepted a referral at the MSIC, not only at the initial site, because we can see in the chart over there that the more that a client visits the MSIC, the more likely they are to go to a drug treatment referral program. But we also see that the MSIC offered broker treatment referrals, which were quite effective in the fact that they, every single client that was offered a broker treatment accepted it. And of those clients, 66% of them had positive outcomes of where they are no longer on drugs or they're still in rehab facilities that are in themselves. And then here we can see the breakdown of what actually was being referred to at the MSIC, again, with about a 15%, 15 to 14, depending on the year, of users being referred to and attending these new programs. Um, so in conclusion, looking at safe injection sites as a whole, we need more research to fully understand how these things affect. We can see a lot of positive outcomes, but these positive outcomes can also be associated with, um, you know, the heroin storage shortage or um, that the amount of overdoses that they are stopping have been almost effectively doubled because they, they have medically trained staff on site. But we can see that they are providing a strong bridge from the facility to detox referrals. We can show that through clients more actively accessing these referral programs, like the Vancouver facility with their 30% uptake compared to previously. Um, so we need longer term studies to also see the effects of cocaine and amphetamines and how the increased use of drugs at those facilities are going to affect in the long term. So, and these will be our sources. Thank you, guys. A sporting society, how the world we grow up in shapes the reason we play. I'm sure we know lots of people who play sports, especially in our school, with all of the clubs and teams that take place there. So why do those kids play sports? If you're on a sports team, why do you think you play sports? There's a wide variety of reasons we might play, but whatever it may be, how does our society, our sports culture, if you will, shape why you play? Why other people? Our curiosity in this question led to our research topic. How does American society sports culture influence the motivations of young athletes? And we encourage you to consider this question as well and wonder what might be driving you or a friend you know to play sports. Our hypothesis going into this study was that young athletes are becoming more extrinsically motivated as a result of our hair sports culture which is going through a process of increasing commercialization and popularization. So as we go through the presentation, there are two questions I want you to ponder on. What message are we sending to young athletes and what are we valuing today when we play sports? To analyze the state of American sports culture, we look primarily at two categories, namely commercialization and popularization. For commercialization, we believe the simple metric would be the minimum salaries for athletes in the NBA, NFL, and MLB, as stated in their collective bargaining agreements, or CBAs for short. In regards to popularization, we looked at the number and variety of sports specific channels in the present day, especially compared to other topics. It is no secret that we live in a sports dominated society. I want you to think about the idolization of. American professional athletes compared to the organization of lawyers, doctors, teachers, even the president sometimes. 
We build cathedrals that house hundreds of thousands of people across the United States. I want you to also ponder on how much more significant the wages are for professional athletes compared to other professions that require much more schooling and training. So we want you to guess how much an athlete is required to be paid from the NBA with no years of experience. Right. Take a minute to guess and hold on to that number. Now imagine what the minimum salary would be for a player in the MLB or the NFL. The reality is that according to the official collective bargaining agreements, NBA athletes with no minimum years of experience, mind you, are paid a minimum of $900,000 a week. For the MLB, that number is slowly approaching 600000 And for the NFL, players will be paid a minimum of $1 million by 2030, with no years in the league. I want you all to hold on to those numbers and compare them to these. These are the average salaries among a lifetime of many different professionals that require much more school or training. A chemical engineer, which requires at least four years of schooling, will make almost $2 million across a lifetime, compared to an NBA player or an NFL player that'll make $2 million in their first two years of playing, with almost no formal education. Think about as a young child, you seen these numbers. Why would you want to go to school? Why would you want to pay to go to college for four to eight years where you can dribble or throw a football and make the same amount of money in less time? Athletes seem to be making quite a hefty sum of money, but are they getting a hefty amount of coverage as well? Well, let's consider some of the sports channels that we might watch on a regular basis. Obviously, there are the big name brands. We have ESPN, Fox Sports, NBC, Maybe you watch CBS sports. Then we begin to consider the Big Ten. Maybe you're into college sports. That's great. But we also have AFN sports. It's a little smaller, but it's still there. And then we consider, you know, um, sports-specific channels like the NBA TV, MLB, the Olympics are coming up. Maybe you want to watch that. And also we have WWE, the NFL, and then Tennis Channel. But we have to consider the Tennis G Network, all the other variations as well. I mean, can you tell me the difference between ESPN Extra and ESPN2? And then there's the NFL red zone. And I think you're starting to get my point. There's being put, there's a, a more of a focus being put on youth athletics today than ever before. There are schools and academies popping up across the United States where athletics are the focus. This is leading to many young athletes to de, put a deep emphasis on education and more of an emphasis on becoming a professional. There are high school juniors our age that are leaving America and going to play in Lithuania or Australia in hopes that they can make it back to the United States to play in the professional league. From this, we can infer some kind of message. Sports, in this instance, seems to equal money in America, a prospect especially appealing to poor classes and racial minorities. With fast track to a rise in fame and popularity, the arduous path of higher, higher education may seem impractical. The gap in current research is wide, but unfortunately, we wanted to look deeper into this question, but we weren't able to find anything specific. And that presents a large gap in the research. And though this gap in current research is wide, filling it is equally important today, as the message we're sending to kids be nothing more than a dangerous myth when paired with Uh, Af Af um, young African Americans are especially at risk of this idolization of athletes and wanting to become a professional athletes instead of getting a formal education. As many African Americans are not portrayed in the media in an idolizing light except for athletes. This creates a false lure of opportunity for young African Americans, as the reality is only 28% of African Americans in the NBA come from low income or non two parent homes. And in fact, according to PhD sociologists like the growing out of the research into the demographics of the NBA um, in regards to um, the player demographics has led them to believe that the hopes of some of these children, the hopes that some of these children may have are quote, virtually unattainable, especially in regards to disadvantaged African Americans. And for athletes in general, the prospect of making it, as it were, is a stacked mountain of odds. If you want to make it beyond high school in any fashion, Studies have found that your odds may be at 17 to 1 at best. 
to go from high school to college for football. Now, this source is dated, but it should go to show that the chances haven't been high again. Another disadvantage of becoming a professional athlete is the lack of job security and the lack of longevity in the careers. This chart is a breakdown of the longevity of NFL careers broken down by position. This has led to 78% of former NFL players and 68% of former NBA players facing financial hardships after retirement. It has been reported that 15% of former NFL players after retirement have filed bankruptcy within 12 years of retirement. A step in the right direction. As of July 1st, 2021, the NCAA has passed a bill that now allows collegiate athletes to be paid for their image and likeness. This discourages the rush to become a professional athlete, especially among young African Americans who come from poverty, to make to the professional community that they feel they have to provide for their family. Now they can stay in college with a formal education while being compensated. However, even this might have some limitations. Every parent wants a kid to be a superstar. Get the kid to buy into your With his talent, well, he can be as successful as he wants to be. To get recruited by a D1 school. The scholarship is the goal. The covenant that I'm making with God is that he'd be number one in the world. I didn't have a dad growing up. Once I saw my son, I wanted to love the dad or something. He just pulled your head out of your ass, dude. You can't even think. It is stupid. I'm done. The first thing I'm going to get to know is the second thing I'm going to I want to be rewarded somehow, somewhere. I didn't do everything I could do. This clip from the Doctor Series in Sports Kids may obviously be um, highly selected, but the point still stands. This could only further the commercialization of sports at an even younger age and pressure both parents and kids to play for their future, not their pleasure, in the form of scholarships and payments for one's likeness. So, what research would be needed to answer our question in Colts of how athlete motivations are being impacted? There's little significant research, which is longitudinal. The introduction of the G League in sporting academies is relatively new, and the salaries and popularity of athletics has only risen in the past year. Longitudinal studies will provide a glimpse into how this rise is shaping their motivations in the time. This doesn't even begin to account for the fact that such appeals might affect people from different race, depending on class, gender, and age differently. Nor is there much which compares sources of motivations for athletes across cultures and nations to see if this is uniquely American or a wider global phenomenon. So we return the question to you. In today's commercialized culture, why do children really play sports? What role does the culture we grow up in have in shaping our motivations for athletics? In the future, our research could reveal that we may be feeding our kids a dangerous myth. Right. Hey y'all, I'm Abby Guys. I'm Tamaya Davidson. And today we are going to be talking about the digital divide and the achievement gap in education. So first, what do you know about the digital divide and or the achievement gap in education? You can just shout out a few things if you feel comfortable. Yeah, I know that schools have a lack of access to computer equipment. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so definition. What is the digital divide and what is the achievement gap in education? So simply, the digital divide is the gap between those that have access to technology or the ability to use, the, to use these technologies and those that don't. Oftentimes, it's misinterpreted that the digital divide is just the gap between those that have access to technology. But oftentimes, people tend to forget that you fall victim to the digital divide if you don't have the ability to use these technologies, whether that's through broadband internet access or the skills to use it. The achievement gap is any significant or persistent disparity in academic performance or educational attainment between different groups of students. As society moves towards technology and schools become more technologically dependent, 
Students that don't have access to computers or laptops or tablets fall behind, and disparities can be shown in test scores, grades, course selection, and dropout rates. So the question we are exploring in our research is, is there a correlation between access to broadband internet and the achievement gap in education? So our method for answering this question um, is examining the digital divide on a national and local level, with local being the state of North Carolina. So we researched where broadband internet is readily available and if this access or lack thereof leads to an achievement gap in education. So Smaya is going to start by talking about the national level. So looking at this chart, the yellow represents urban areas, the red represents the United States as a whole, and the blue represents rural areas. From 2013 to 2017, we have constantly seen that rural areas have been behind uh, urban areas and have been lacking through uh, access to 25 megabits per second uh, broadband internet. One thing that this chart does not take into consideration is whether or not these people are able to afford the internet, this chart just takes into consideration the cell towers and the amount of area that they are able to reach. This chart, specifically the middle chart right here, takes into account the broadband access in non-metro and metro areas. The percentages are lower than the chart before because 66% of people in non-metro areas are able to afford internet, while 80% in metro areas are. So specifically looking at uh, education, looking at the dark orange, bachelor's degrees are higher and Rural areas in 2019, 21% uh, had a bachelor's degree or higher. And in urban areas in 2019, 34.7% had a bachelor's degree or higher. This chart shows disparities throughout uh, education and the attainments after college. So the digital divide in all areas. 25% of school-aged children live in households without broadband access or web-enabled devices such as a tablet or computer. This was done in 2017, um, but there has been progress to close the digital divide. The global market for PCs is experiencing the largest growth in, in the past 20 years with near, nearly 80 million units sold in quarter three of 2020. Um, according to a study done by Broadband Now, supported by the SBC, Federal Communications Commission, 42 million Americans still don't have access to broadband internet, and this was done in October of 2020. So, COVID-19 and, and its impact on the digital divide. Without surprise, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the digital divide, um, teachers also feel victims to this divide with not being able to use some of the technologies such as Zoom or Teams meetings um, this past year due to the pandemic. In terms of the achievement gap, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted it in many ways other than making technology a reliable tool for some. Parents, and specifically parents in low-income families, have had to work multiple jobs, so these parents are not able to attend to their kids and their schoolwork. And now Abby is going to talk about the digital divide on North Carolina level. Thank you. All right. So a quick statistic, roughly 35% of the student body in North Carolina lives in rural areas. And so since there is a lack of access to technology in those areas, it is harder for those students to complete their schoolwork and thus be successful in school. And so a local Charlotte resident, Yolanda Ames, she discussed her children's struggles, um, especially during COVID because she has not been able to afford broadband internet subscription for two years because she balances paying rent, working, and trying to support her kids. And so she is one of 45,000 households in Charlotte alone without a subscription to the internet. And there's an estimated 290,000 students in homes without internet in North Carolina. And Franny Mellon is a local Charlotte resident who started an organization E2D or Eliminate Digital Divide when she noticed in middle school that some of her classmates could not complete their schoolwork because they did not have the access to technology to do so. And she said, I wanted to do something about that to create equality. So, by the numbers, before I show you the graph, out of the 100 counties in North Carolina, how many do you think that 80% or more households are subscribed to the internet? You can shout out some numbers. 75. 50. Fabulous. Okay, so. Nine counties in North Carolina, these dark blue areas, um, have 80% or more households subscribe to the internet. And you can see that in the very pale color, less than 60%, and then as you get a little darker, 60 to 70, and then 70 to 80, and 80% or more. And so you can see that there is a concentration of internet access in, the, in many urban areas. And in this next chart, we can see that in those same areas, there's a higher concentration of adults with post-secondary degrees. So we can see that in those same areas, more than 60% of adults have their post-secondary degrees. 
So, but don't give up hope. We are making progress. We are closing the divide. In North Carolina in 2018, the Growing Rural Economy with Access to Technology or GREAT program was passed that works to expand technological access in rural areas. And with the Federal American Rescue Plan passed in Congress in March of 2020 during COVID, um, North Carolina passed a House Bill 947 that directs those funds $750 million to finding what they call donut holes in rural areas in order to provide that technology that is lacking. And so even with this increased broadband internet access, more needs to be done because students need to know how to use these technologies that they now have access to. So what does this mean now? What does this data mean and what can we do to further our research? Based on our research, we can conclude that there is a correlation between a lack of access to broadband and the achievement gap in education. But is that the only factor that correlates to the achievement gap in education? So due to a limited time period, we were unable to conduct our own experiments, and we were also unable to look into more factors other than geographical location. So we hope to do more research involving the impact of gender, race, socioeconomic status, and more that contribute to the digital divide and see if there's a correlation between a certain factor and the achievement gap in education. So what can you do if you have old computers at home that you're not using, you can send them to this address right here and E2D will refurbish and then distribute those to students in need and also donations can be made there at e 2 eorg slash donate if you feel like it. Thank you. And I'm Sophia Singer, and we're going to be talking about the effects of social media on teenagers. First, I'll look at this chart of the prevalence of social media in teens in the U.S. So these are looking out of the first three percentages into the 81% of teens use social media and 73% of teens use social media at least daily. So we're going to look at this scale. Can you use this QR code? And it's going to ask you one question. And it's going to talk about whether social media has positively or negatively, which is our question. I'll just give you a few seconds.
team's attention. Um, it also has artificial aspects in social media, um, like with rejection and acceptance, because in the real world, we see it more ambiguous, but it's not quantifiable online with followers and likes. There is also unattainable expectations of body image. Um, social media is one of the biggest causes of lower self-esteem and body image issues. Michael Daly of the American Psychological Association claims that adolescents, particularly females, who spend five or more hours on social media versus one, is 66% more likely to commit suicide due to a decrease in self-worth. Um, it is also common for certain bodies to be praised while others are cyberbullied. And there are a lot of people who alter their body on the internet, which made people believe that's what their body should like when they're not even real. And then clothing brands and modeling companies online show only one type of body and they deem that as a perfect body. So Ashley just went over all the negative effects, but there has to be some positive effects for us to have a draw to social media in the first place. So just as a quick overview, there are lots of positive effects. Some of these include school readiness, positive social behaviors, tolerance, civic participation, knowledge, um, and then the three that I'm gonna focus on are mostly positive self-image, academic performance, and inclusion. So one of the great things is about social media is that it's a platform for people from all different places and all different demographics to come together um, and they can create groups where they have a shared interest and they can advocate for something together. But these groups can be super diverse because people can be from anywhere because you have such a great platform that's so large and um, prevalent. So the first study I'd like to look at um, is the 2018 study performed by the Pew Research Center. They did it on 734 teens who were aged 13 to 17. And they essentially sent out a very extensive questionnaire where they asked where they received lots of data. So one of the most significant pieces of data that I found is that eight in 10 teens say social media makes them feel more connected to what's going on in their friend's life. And if you're able to feel more connected with what's going on in your friend's life, you're going to be able to build better relationships. So if we look at this infographic, we can see that um, social media actually makes teens more included, confident, authentic, and outgoing. And a lot of times we may think, I don't know if social media makes me feel more included because I may see a post of my friends and I, they didn't invite me. However, there's so many opportunities for people to come together and form these large groups with shared interests that it makes it a much more inclusive space than what you might find in the real world per se. So the second study I'd like to look at um, is a, another 2018 study performed at Alberoni University, which is in Afghanistan. And essentially, they took a questionnaire with 371 undergraduate students from all different demographics and grade point averages, um, I believe across nine different majors. Um, I do think these results are pretty reliable because they were from such a wide variety. So the results showed that there was no statistically significant difference concerning the negative effects of social media on academic performance. So essentially, if you took one group of people that use social media and you took another group that did it, you're not going to see a significant difference in their academic performance and grade scores, for example. So they ultimately found that social media appears to be a very useful tool for students to improve their learning process because there's just so many opportunities within social media to interact with so many different people and to learn so many new things. So now that we've heard both positive and social aspects, we get back to our original question, is social media positive or is it negative for teens? So the first study that I talked about is a continuation of the study I'm talking about right now. So it's that same 2018 study by the Pew Research Center. And they essentially found that there's no clear consensus among teens whether they believe social media is positive or negative. So those who find it positive say it helps with connectivity. Um, a 15-year-old girl said, quote, I feel that social media can make people my age feel less lonely or alone. It creates a space where you can interact with people. On the other side of the spectrum, you have those who find it negative, say it increases bullying and rumors. A 13-year-old boy says, quote, gives people a bigger audience to speak and teach hate and belittle each other. And there's validity to both sides of this argument. So as you can see in this infographic, 31% found it mostly positive, 45 said neither positive or negative, and 24% said mostly negative. So there's not a clear majority here. Honestly, the majority is with 
kind of in the middle where it's neither positive or negative. So as you can see in the corner, it says percent of US teens who say social media has had blank on people their own age. That's the exact same question we asked you. So let's look at what you guys said. So as you can see here, um, this is way higher than what the actual, than what that study found. So 47.4% of you in this room said that it was mostly negative in comparison to only 24%. 45% um, said it was neither, while we have 31.6% saying neither. So this is actually a big difference um, in comparison to what that research study found to what we have in this room, which is very interesting. So our conclusion is essentially that yes, social media has both positive and negative aspects. But if you use social media in a positive way, its positive effects will outweigh the negative ones for you. So MIT's Mind, Heart, and Hand Club came up with nine tips um, for social media use and being healthy with it. So just one of the ones that I thought was really good was live in the moment because being aware of the present moment is crucial to your connections and experiences. I thought take a break and support others in doing so was very important because sometimes we need to take a step away from social media, interact with others in real life, and support our friends. And that's it. Thank you. And today our presentation is going to be on recidivism in U.S. prisons. The question that will be guiding us through our presentation today is what approach should the United States criminal justice system adopt that will promote equity during incarceration and reduce recidivism upon release? This topic is really important because American society often views ex-convicts as uh, incapable of change and often doesn't treat them with human dignity. Throughout our cornerstone, we want to explore the different correctional approaches and challenge the current punitive framework of mass incarceration. This topic of recidivism specifically is important because of those incarcerated in the United States, over 95% of them will eventually be released back into their community. Ensuring that ex-convicts have proper support and skills will produce better outcomes in our society. So before we begin, we'd like to define two terms for us. The first is recidivism, which is a person's relapse back into criminal behavior, so how likely it is for them to reoffend again. The second is desistance, which is the ultimate goal here, which is when they enter a, uh, a state of permanent non-offending. So just as a disclaimer, this presentation will only be discussing recidivism in prison and not jail. The difference between the two is that prisons are generally more long-term holding facilities, for harsher crimes like felonies, while prison, sorry, while jails are shorter term for minor crimes. Then to give some background on our current prison, the population has quadrupled since the 1980s, and that was the result of minimum sentencing for drug when in suicide. Our next background is that the average sentence length in the United States is five times longer than the international average. So what is our actual recidivism rate? The national average is about 77%, meaning that out of every 100 offenders, 77 of them will be rearrested within five years. And that uh, number in terms of our own state is around 36% will return in two years. So many factors contribute to how likely one is to reoffend again. Here are just some of the factors that we considered, including the lack of family support, on uh, unemployment, the racial disparities that we have within our communities that we've explored throughout our past weeks here, poverty, also the lack of education. Next, we're going to explore the current prison conditions. And I want you to consider how these existing inequalities may impact recidivism. So looking at violence, research found that 20% of female and 25% of male inmates have reported being sexually, sorry, being physically assaulted, and that was either by another inmate or a correctional officer. That same study found that youth were more likely to be impacted by this type. Looking at healthcare, 
prison suicides have increased 20% within the years 2017 to 2018. So just in one year, we saw a 20% increase. 58% uh, of prisoners have a substance abuse problem, and that's compared to only 5% in the general population. Then when we take a look at mass incarceration, among a five-year period of 2007 to 2012, crime rates fell by 21%, but the prison population didn't follow that same trend, and it only decreased by 1%. So post-incarceration, ex-convicts run through a lot of challenges as well, as this, as this graphic demonstrates here, the cycle that our policy or lack there are perpetuates. So during incarceration, they cannot advance their work skills because we don't have a program and we don't invest enough in them for them to develop either those cognitive or actual skills for employment. So post-incarceration employers are hesitant to employ them or even invest in low-skilled uh, workers because of the question that we often see on applications, have you ever been convicted of theft? Uh, so that, that cycle was created, therefore, because they struggle with reintegrating back to society and they don't have the necessary either family relationship or financial support they need for them to really fit into society and establish a stable living again. And just something that I've mentioned is that particularly during the first two weeks of release for ex-convicts, they have a higher risk of death compared to the rest of the population. And they also have difficulty holding down jobs even if they manage to require one because, because of their lack of skills and how they haven't been able to interact with others in a normal way. Um, that might contribute to homelessness, uh, poverty, or returning to bad habits such as substance abuse. So now we're going to consider six different categories of correctional strategy, and we'd like you guys to consider what do you think is the most important and which one should be the guiding factor in our criminal justice system. And it's important to keep in mind that they don't, they're not mutually exclusive and they sometimes overlap as we consider some of the programs that we will look at today. So the first is deterrence, which is just punishment that are meant to deter a criminal from committing that crime again. An example of this might be a fine that one needs to pay as an incentive to not engage in that behavior again. The next one is incapacitation. This deprives the offender of the capacity to commit crimes. An example of this would be imprisonment. Next, we have community control, uh, which is just supervision and uh, supervision within that community, so something like home arrest would definitely fall under this category. The next would be discipline programs. These are very popular for juvenile offenders. These are physically or mentally challenging experiences that change offenders in a positive manner. An example of this would be a correctional boot camp. Next, we have restoration or so-called restorative justice, which is a definitely newer and less mainstream approach. It's more victim-driven, aiming to hold offenders accountable while seeking to repair the harm visited upon the victim. So this might be in the form of, say, a written or a verbal apology, some sort of unpaid work for the family, or just any forms of reconciliation, that, whether through a community panel or a family conference. And the last uh, method that we're going to look at is rehabilitation. This is programs directed towards challenging the offender to prevent further criminal behavior. This can be in the form of education or job training. And later in the presentation, we're going to take a look at specific rehabilitation programs that are happening now in the United States. So what did we eventually find? Uh, researchers conclude that the most effective model to follow is the so-called NR, excuse me, RNR model, risk meets responsibility. So this, that, this ultimately means that the one size fits all approach does not work. And treatment programs need to have different lengths and styles to accommodate individuals depending on their risk and their needs. So the first step of this would be uh, would be accessing the level of risk that they pose, depending on how short and how intensive the program seems to be. Second is addressing the needs of the individual, whether that be static or dynamic, so things that have caused them to commit crimes in the first place, and the and the challenges that they might be struggling with at the at the moment, such as substance abuse. And then finally, it involves developing personalized methods that suit their personalities and how they learn. Um, next, we're going to take a look at Norway, which has a drastically different prison system to that of the United States. Norway has a system of open and closed prisons, and these give inmates more responsibilities. They have a better emphasis on helping convicts integrate back into society, and that's through social support services. And we can see that their recidivism rates are only 20%, which is the lowest in the world. Um, Norway follows the uh, model of the Pygmalion effect, 
Um, and the Pygmalion effect is basically people do better when more is expected from them. So um, how Norway gives their prisoners more responsibilities, they expect more from them, they expect them to be rehabilitated and uh, function in society, and therefore they see better outcomes. So some other potential proposed and existing programs that we looked at including uh, prison-based therapeutic communities, an example of which is in New York. Uh, the same not program that has been in place since, the since 1977. So that's just a community that has uh, both group and individual therapy that allows them to rehabilitate. Another one looked at is, as Rebecca mentioned before, correction book camps, which are more for juvenile minor offenders, and that involves a lot of highly structured physical and um, manual labor and tasks that they need to complete to complete to distill a sense of discipline into them. And lastly, we have a realignment, which is a bill that's trying to pass in California, which is simply putting certain offenders into jails and better prisons. And lastly, second chance is some mentorship programs that are getting trying to get funding, um, which will help them upon release. So what did we conclude? Uh, we concluded that. Effective correctional treatment should follow three, uh, excuse me, should follow four principles. First is the RNR model, as we mentioned before, risk, need, responsibility. The second is incorporating human service components, meaning that they should be individualized and targeted towards that individual. Thirdly, be skills oriented and structured to build human and social capital for that ex convict so that when they re enter back into society, they can build a stable life. And lastly, they should be designed based on cognitive behavioral studies. So not coming in with the assumptions that people cannot change and recognizing that we need to adjust what we're doing for them to fit their current needs and risk. And thank you guys. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Asha Credit and my research partner is Dante Wobbly. This is our presentation, Not Your Fetish, Orientalism, Jezebel Stereotype, and Hypersexualization of Minority Group. As a disclaimer, we will talk about some heavy topics, so please feel free to step out if you feel uncomfortable or head out the Zoom. Okay, so ladies, have you ever been called foreign, obedient, passive, exotic, helpless, or submissive? Or maybe you've been called a hoe, that you're stubborn, bitchy, bossy, angry looking. Or maybe you've been physically touched, ogled, felt sought after due to your ethnicity. Have you ever been looked at by the male gaze or been catcalled? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you are not alone. Many women experience sexual, sexual objectification as it is an issue that you or someone you know has probably contributed to. The media reciprocates harmful stereotypes that often trivialize violence against girls. Don't get me wrong, all women experience it. However, for women of color, hypersexualization is different. This idea has led my partner, Dante, and I to the following question. Given the idea that racial fetishization is ubiquitous, how has it placed a burden on POC women on today's racial head? First, we will talk about the Jezebel stereotype, the portrayal of Black women as lewd by nature, and the descriptive words associated with this are seductive, alluring, worldly, and tempting. Historically, white women are seen as respectable, self-controlling, modest, and even sexually pure. But Black women are often portrayed as innately promiscuous, even predatory. This depiction of Black women has been identified by scholars as the Jezebel stereotype. According to David Pilgrim, Europeans traveled to Africa and interpreted semi-nudity as lewdness. White Europeans locked into the racial ethnocentrism of the 17th century and saw African polygamy and tribal dancing as proof of the African's uncontrolled sexual lust. Europeans were fascinated by sexual, sex, African sexuality and the genesis of anti-Black sexual archetypes emerged from the writings of these Europeans. The Black male as brute and potential rapist and Black women as the Jezebel whore. Pilgrims claimed the Jezebel stereotype was used during slavery as a rationalization for sexual relations between white men and Black women, especially sexual unions involving masters and slaves, and the Jezebel depicted Black women as not satisfied with Black men, and we know now, however, that Black women have never had the agency as they were treated as the property of white men. Therefore, the category of rape didn't legally apply to Black women. Uh, from, John, from Thomas Jefferson to George Washington's men, 
America's history has been stained with white race of black women. Although Jezebel's stereotype has been characterized as the prevailing image of black women overlooking stereotypes as loving, unattractive, mothering caricatures of black women like Aunt Jemima, for example, scholars are now beginning to develop more complex theories on black women. Among the new theories is the concept of ungendering. Ungendering is the phenomenon that strips black women of their femininity and compares to the delicate white woman. Additionally, ungendering in Jezebel stereotypes doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. One can be both portrayed as emasculating while being sexualized and objectified by the mother. We see here that Black women are simultaneously seen as promiscuous as an object catering for male sex sexual fantasies, while also being dismissed for failing to assimilate into white supremacist constructions of gender. Again, with Michelle Obama, and again, with Serena Williams. Arguably, we see the state of Black womanhood with the highest degree of charity with discussing Black women in sports. At the same time, they're still more likely to be objectified and dehumanized, and these harmful stereotypes rooted in colonial and slave narratives still persist in our characterization of Black women today. Next up is Orientalism, a, a term coined by Palestinian author, author Edward Said. Orientalism can be understood as social and aesthetic phenomenon catering around exotified misrepresentations of Asian and African places, <laughs> objects, and people. Here's the history. After the Opium Wars, American women, or uh, Asian women, sorry, immigrated as various groups. Many became merchant wives, servants, indentured slaves, and prostitutes. Though many anti-immigration laws were passed against them, that all changed after World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and as well as the Philippine Islands of our group. Asian women were seen as war brides in America's history, with laws passed like the War Brides Act of 1943 and 1945, and the Alien Fiancés Act of 1943. 90% of Asian immigrants in 1948 to 1953 were Asian women, 52,000 Filipino women, 40,000 Japanese, and 15,000 Korean and Vietnamese. With this media representation, representation of Asian women like Madame Butterfly, where it portrays a 15-year-old being sold for sex, portrays them the Asian culture as childlike, films like The World of Susie Wong, with Susie as a lotus butterfly, and War Bride. Asian women are perceived as sexualized and exotic. They are desperate to be saved by men from first world countries. Now in the 21st century, we see that hypersexualization of Asian women in the media is still taking place. Take a look at the first 10 seconds of this music video by artist Gucci Mane and other guys. Asian women have come a long way in terms of being accurately depicted in media, but they still have a long way to go before they are correctly identified on screen. The shooting in Atlanta is a deadly reminder to Asian American women that they are seen by many men as a sex, sex objects who exist to satisfy their warped desires. It is crucial to understand that violence against Asian women, like what occurred in the Atlanta shooting, is a direct product of stereotypes and media portrayals. An analysis by the California State University Center of Study of Hate and Extremism found that crimes against Asian Americans rose nearly 150% in 2020. But the issue persists in many other cultures. Native women are two times more likely to be sexually assaulted than other women in the United States. Not only do the movies portray Europeans as the more dominant conqueror, but it also hypersexualized indigenous women. The hypersexualization contributes to degradation and objectification, which directly leads to violence against indigenous women and girls. As a society, we need to be conscious of these vulnerable positions of indigenous women that stem from colonization. Hispanic women are faced with similar issues, media portrayal like the one seen here. Latinas are seen as the physical embodiment of overly sexual and curvaceous objects, taunting and misguiding men for decades in American media. This leads to Latino women being seen as tools for an agenda rather than their work ethic. South Asian women exist at an intersection of being exoticized and being undergendered. South Asian women have always had their femininity question when compared to white men and have been labeled as more primitive, dirtier, and hairier than their white male and women female counterparts. However, their forgiveness still primes them, or their foreignness still primes them for fetishization from the Western male gaze. Middle Eastern women have a unique position with the Western imagination. The Middle Eastern woman whose job is often the subject of male sexual desires. The unveiled Middle Eastern woman is seen as innocent and mysterious, oftentimes used as a challenge for white men to conquer. 
for Middle Eastern women who choose not to wear a hijab, they are portrayed as exotic, hypersexualized beings, or subjected to both racist and misogynist misogynistic tropes that interact with each other. This leaves Middle Eastern women as fetishized objects in both mass media and everyday interactions. Women of color are not airheaded fantasies to be used in your ignorant songs, plays, and movies. With their constant misrepresentation in the media, men view women as objects, leading to harassment, discrimination, violence, and even human trafficking. Women of color are not to be classified under a certain characteristic, and the National Women's Law Center reported that one of the barriers of school success for Black girls is an implicit and explicit bias against Black girls leading to racial and sexual stereotypes. Understand that there are many things left uncovered in this presentation, but let us leave you with the following question. What is the difference between a preference and a fetish? Have you or someone you know perpetuated this issue? And consider how you feel about attempts to appropriate or glamorize, glamorize women of color. Thank you. All right, I'm Trey Chondon. I'm Xavier French, and we're going to be talking about the introduction and evolution of modern American economics. So the question that we proposed was, is the US economy stable and healthy? And in this little short um, section, we're gonna be talking about what is an economy, what defines economic success, what is GDP, the concept of the standard of living in relation to GDP, and the problems with GDP. So let's get into it. So basically what an economy is, an economy is defined as by a process or system by which goods and services are produced, sold and bought in a country or region. Now, the reason why I included two definitions is because it shows there's a very point blank definition to what an economy is. Now, economic success is a little different. You know, a lot of people describe it as how well, um, how well basically the economy is delivering the things that the people need and how it is circulating and how well it's circulating. But a lot of people look at GDP, GDP for economic success as it provides literal jet data as far as how large your economy is. So let's look at GDP. I'm going to play this short little video so you get like a, a basic idea of what GDP is and then we'll move on from there. The letters GDP are flung around often by the President, the Federal Reserve Board, journalists, and many others. They stand for Gross Domestic Product, which represents the overall market value of all the goods and services a country produces. In a way, it's like a price tag on a country's output, and it measures the size of the economy. The price is determined with the following formula, C plus G plus I plus NX equals GDP, where C is the nation's private consumption or consumer spending. G is the sum of government spending, I is the sum of businesses' capital spending, and NX is the nation's total net exports, exports minus imports. GDP is an important number because it indicates whether a country's economy is growing and expanding or shrinking and contracting. It also gives important information about how the introduction of new products and services or the improvement of existing ones affect demand. This data helps to plan future product development and improvements. It also helps a country to stack its economy up against others in the world and determine whether it's growing at a comparable rate. While it's not a perfect science, GDP can also be used to get an estimate of a country's standard of living. The idea is that... So that basically is all I wanted to cover in that because the video specifically talks about uh, the standard of living. And that's something I wanted to touch upon because GDP doesn't directly define anything. I mean, it doesn't directly define the standard of living. You want to look more at GDP per capita, but even then it's not a perfect science as the video stated. So GDP per capita basically shows how much economic production value can be attributed to each individual citizen. So it's more, it's better than GDP as far as discovering like economic health, but it's not where it needs to be. And basically, it, it serves as like a prosperity measure, if you will. Um, like I said, um, although it's better, a lot of its problems include its reliance on monetary values and prices. The fact that most people don't see a connection between GDP and improvements in their lives. People aren't going to look at a GDP number and say, oh, my life is better because this number is high. It's not the case. So um, you can see that, especially with like Brazil, we're at the we're at the top, and you know people can argue like, oh, 
well, although our number is high, we have really affluent communities or whatever. We'll take Brazil, for example, which struggles with poverty, they're in the top nine, but this is the GDP per capita. All I'm going to say is yikes. So, all right, so next up, we're going to be covering about economic indicators of interest. Uh, we have four key economic indicators we'd like to focus on, the first of which is inflation. The second is the GDP to debt ratio of the nation. The third is capitalization to GDP ratio. And the final one is wealth polarization. Xavier will cover inflation and I'll get the other three. All right, so basically the US is currently seeing some unusually high consumer good, good prices, like basically things like flights, chick uh, lumber, chicken wings are higher. Um, people fear that this is going to lead to a period of worrisome inflation. Um, I'm not going to get into what happened in the 1970s because if you're not um, familiar with the term stagnation, it's of very little importance. But a lot of economists argue that we're, this isn't a long period that's going to happen. It's very short. People argue that you know we're just a little hot right now. We'll rebound later. But you know, considering trends that have happened, I I doubt. It. So as you can see right here, there's a quick little graph about inflation in the United States. Um, there's a quick little graph about inflation in the United States. You can see that gasoline has increased dramatically, over 52% actually, year over year from May 2020 to May 2021. Uh, this is probably responsible for the fact that you see eye popping gas prices at this point. You go to the gas station uh, one year ago, May 2020, you'll see a gallon of gas for about 275. All of a sudden, you come to the same gas station a year later, and for some reason, the gallon of gas is nearly four months. Uh, so you can see over the past year, Consumer good spending or consumer good prices have increased across the board, and this is how inflation really goes to hurt consumers. Second economic indicator we'd like to focus on is the debt to GDP ratio. Now, what is the debt to GDP ratio? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's the ratio of America's debt to its GDP. Debt in the sense of the national government is actually highly similar to debt in a personal sense as well, because it's just a summation of all the debt we owe to our debt holders, whether that be foreign governments, whether that's individuals, whether that's corporations or any other entity. Uh, this data is from the federal research economic data from the federal bank in St. Louis. Uh, you can see that we managed to keep our debt to GDP ratio very stable right up until 2008, which was the beginning of the Obama uh, administration. And that was when government spending fully began to inflate itself compared to how much we actually produced. Once again, it stagnated up until 2020, right when coronavirus hit, and then boom, we have a spike up to $28.54 trillion of American national debt, in contrast to only $22.25 trillion of American GDP in 2020. This reflects a 128.27% debt to GDP ratio, but you're probably wondering, hey, Trey, why does any of this matter? Well, the fact is there are two key things that we'd like to focus on in terms of significance. The first of which is treasury yields going up and spendable money by the American government going down. Treasury yields are essentially the interest rates that the Federal uh, Bank of the United States offers to potential investors or potential debt holders. Like, hey, if you buy some of our debt right now, if you give us $10,000, for example, we'll give you 3% a year for the next five or seven years. Investors will see that and be like, yeah, sure, that's good. As the debt to GDP ratio increases, the Treasury has to increase this rate higher and higher to keep um, investors buying our debt so we don't default on any of our credit obligations. The reason this decrease is spendable money by the American government is because the American government has to pay interest on these um, treasury bonds. The fact is that the higher and higher the treasury yields go, the more and more interest we have to pay, lowering the amount of total discretionary spending that the American government has to spend on actual services that we can use. Second thing is the increase of the rate of risk-free return. The rate of risk-free return is typically me uh, measured by the one-year or the three-year treasury bill, uh, which is, like I said, the um, bonds that are issued by the American government. Uh, this rate of risk-free return is super appealing to investors because they see the U.S. government as basically infallible. Whatever that rate is for the treasury yield is going to be the rate of risk-free return. They can put 10000 bucks in at 3%, they can sleep well at night knowing that that 3% is guaranteed for them. And that actually dissuades them from investing in other riskier vehicles, for example, individual company stocks, along with corporate bonds, and many other things. I don't really need to elaborate too much to let you all know that that is very bad for us if we do not invest in capital markets and innovation. That leads to a slowdown of economic productivity and a whole other host of things. Third economic indicator to focus on is capitalization to GDP ratio. The capitalization to GDP ratio is quite simply just the summation of the market value of all stocks and all companies in a certain country to the value of its GDP. 
Uh, for example, for us in the US, that would be summation of all stocks listed and all companies listed on the NYSE or the S&P 500, the Dow 30, et cetera, as a ratio to our GDP. You see that I have four brackets listed on the right side here, a GDP or capitalization to GDP ratio of lower than 75% generally shows that a capital market in a nation is grossly undervalued. 75 to 90 percent in the case of the market is fairly valued. 90 to 115 percent means that it's slightly overvalued, with 115 plus percent meaning it is horribly overvalued. I'll let that 205.97 percent at the top for a second. So, why does this matter? Valuation. It's one word, it's the most effective way to phrase this. The fact is that valuation matters because if a market is overvalued, that's going to lead to investors being wary of whether they should actually invest in a company or invest in a market at all. And along with that, this extremely high amount of uh, ratio, for example, like I said, 205.97%, leads investors to think that there is a chance a bubble could be forming. And that bubble, when it pops, could erase millions, billions, and even trillions of dollars of wealth from the global economy in a matter of seconds. Fourth and final economic indicator we'd like to focus on is the polarization of wealth. Uh, we have a short video by the St. Louis Fed in 2019 to play real quick.
Is there a political polarization in the U.S. and how is its absence or presence affecting our democracy? Now, if we're going to talk about political polarization, it's important that we know where it is. Political polarization is the divergence of political attitudes to ideological extremes. Almost all discussions of political polarization consider it in the context of political party and democratic systems of government. In most two party systems, political polarization embodies the tension of its primary political ideology and partisan identities. In the next slide, we will see an example of what this division looks like during the election cycle. Next slide. A must see debate. Two bitter rivals going head to head for the first time. Both candidates fighting to seize momentum in the final stretch of a close and polarized race. Two nominees, one stage, and America's future. <laughs> This culture of politics where we view each of our parties as a sports team is something we like to call tribalism. Tribalism is a way of thinking or behaving in a way in which people are excessively loyal to their own tribe. Tribes may include a school, a family, and a good space political party. Now, with tribalism often comes naive realism, which is the um, human tendency to believe that we see the world around us objectively, and there's so much to see deep. They're either um, irrational, uninformed, or biased. This can cause people to go out of their way to defend a belief that they might not agree with, but it's the belief of their tribe, just so that they can feel accepted. Some other terms to know are voter apathy, alienation, and farm line voting, but we're going to skip over them just to save time. So, is there political polarization? Um, as you can see here, it looks like it, yes, because all these graphs are different studies that basically show that there's a huge ideological divide amongst us between Democrats and Republicans. So what causes polarization in our society? Um, I think we can all agree that media plays a huge role in how we make politics. There's a national agenda to focus the public attention on certain aspects of American politics by ignoring others. It influences the issues that people believe are or are not important. The stories that are likely to receive high ratings are more likely to be covered, which in turn forces politicians to focus on certain issues that they otherwise would ignore. This mass media is used to link the general public with politicians. Its messages are often simplified, stereotyped, predictable, and have characteristics such as being more personalized, emotional, and formal. So a lot of us, as you know, uh, know that <laughs> there's a huge bias in the media. Uh, a lot of this stems from the fact that media is used as entertainment, and the main goal for media companies is to make money. And the best way for them to make money is to make these stories interesting. And so we, we typically will make the stories more polarized in order to attract the um, voters. So if you look here, uh, they have the same story covered in just a plethora of different ways just because of polarization. And as you can see here, so many of us get our news from social media. And then another reason the media has a huge bias is because of consolidation, which means that a lot of the media companies are actually <laughs> owned by the same people. So we have a couple hundred executives who control our sources for almost 300 million Americans. And then we have media bubbles. And so what that means is that we kind of surround ourselves with the same uh, kind of views over and over and over again. And one of the reasons this happens is because social media platforms have algorithms that will show us what they think that we're interested in. And we also tend to disregard things that are separate from what we believe. And because of this, we're just kind of getting the same information over and over again from the same point of views. And then we have voter activism, which just says that the people who are most active in politics tend to be the most polarized. And so they're pushing 
more and more polarized uh, <laughs> just policies. So it's not really accurately representing the beliefs of the general public because voters may be polarized, but in general, the American public is not all that polarized. And then we have in the um, bias, which just is talking about idealism. So we tend to just disregard things that are not of our opinion, of the opinions of our own tribes. And it just tends to prove to us that our point of view is the correct one. And then structural barriers, all this means is that the entire structure of our political system plays to the strengths of a two-party system and will keep a third party from ever being elected. And this is because the electoral college and the winner takes all system and single vote ballots. And then socialization agents, that's just a really important thing to know when talking about how we come to our own political ideologies. And so socialization agents are just parts of who we are that shape our beliefs. So this could be our gender, our ethnicity, race, socioeconomic status, our education level. And then what are the effects of polarization? Um, there are a ton of effects in polarization, and I don't think we have enough time to cover all of them. Um, but I think the one that you hear most about in the news is the lack of political efficacy. Um, it's when our political parties, because our political parties are moving so far to the left and to the right, they are not willing to compromise on any issues or any bill um, because they feel as though it will satisfy their constituents. If they stay firm and firm on the issues um, that matter most to them. But what it really does is just causes people to not be willing to work and not with each other. And it leads to what we would call in Congress a good talk, where we have a, a period of time where there are no new bills being passed or signed by the president because we have Democrats and Republicans who refuse to work together to pass this talk. So, a huge effect of polarization is one that you've probably come in contact multiple times um, social or society. So, Societal animosity. Uh, so that's just saying that Democrats and Republicans hate each other. Uh, there is a study that shows that almost half of Democrats or Republicans would be mad if their kid were to marry somebody of the opposite political ideology, which is stupid. Um, we literally just hate people who don't have the same beliefs as us because we've been told that they're so ideologically polarized that they're just like all the way over there. Um, but in fact, that's just not the case. Um, there's a, another study that took 80,000 people over multiple years and asked them about policies um, in the US and issues. And it shows that most people were able to agree, or agree about 150 different issues that America is facing today. And after discussing things, they could come to conclusions that um, both of them agreed with a lot easier than people in Congress can. Um, so in all actuality, the general public is not all that polarized. Um, it's just what we've been shown. And so what are the solutions to polarization? other than uh, dismantling uh, electoral college and our voting system. Uh, you can focus on issues instead of parties, really spend time researching the different issues and policies and their effects instead of what you've been told by far left or far right media sources. Just do your own research. Don't say because it's their power, because it's their public and you're gonna vote or not vote about it. Um, and then break out of your media bubble. If you only follow left-leaning people, follow right-leaning people, not Trump, because that is not 
a good source to follow. Um, other ones are very accurate sources just because they're not of your political ideology does not mean they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and it's going to broaden what you know and give you a much better uh, knowledge about the different topics. And then learn to listen. If you're having a conversation with somebody who just has different beliefs than you, listen with an open mind. Don't like close yourself off because you're just not going to learn enough if you listen to things closed off. Just kind of be open to everybody around you, regardless of your political ideology, because everybody's beliefs are valid. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, whether you were in Zoom, in person, or thank you very much for watching the recording. Appreciate it.